Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Tammy Rittock. Ready, Tammy, you ready to be great today? I am. So, Tammy, this should be a softball question for you. <laughs> On your LinkedIn, it says, open your doors and empowering dreamers in a housing market designed to get keep. What, mm -hmm. what in the world does that mean? <laughs> uh, what that means is the housing market has increased in value uh, significantly over the past decade. And um, it has shut out a lot, a lot of middle. You want to verify these numbers because these are off the top of my head. But but ballpark range, this is good. Between 2011, I think 2019-ish, housing prices have increased uh, like 60%, where income has increased like 5%. So I'm jumping in because folks that are trying to save for a down payment, payment you know, the goalpost keeps changing. So they keep getting left behind. They're priced out of the housing market. And I've been in real estate for a couple of decades now. Uh, it's been a great career. And at some point I kind of started to feel a little bit icky about it because my income was going up and no, you know, the bulk of everybody else was not. And um, I just feel like as an industry, we're not doing enough to address it. So that's what I'm trying to do is help people get into homes. And so where do these stats come from? Like, I'm guessing they come from reliable. So they come from like some kind of national housing industry, some kind of banking. Cause I would think if they come, I'm not saying stats lie, but you know, like 10% of 10 out of hundred is very different from 10 out of 10,000, right? Where the case should be like, they come from like housing, from bankers, lenders, where do these stats actually come from? Yeah. You know, I kind of get them all over the place. Um, I definitely get it from like the National Association of Realtors. Um, I'll get it from Redfin. I'll get it from like community data, like King County da data. Um, so I like to, specifically, I'll use like in the Pacific Northwest, I'll use the NWMLS and then I'll use the county data and I'll put the two together and kind of back out from there. It's kind of funny how, to me, it's all relative, right? Because like, like, of course, San Francisco has a crazy market. Seattle's has a little, little less than that. Like, even Texas, house market going up. But I think Texas is worse because, you know, the, the income's lower there, right? And then, you know, people from New York and California moving to Texas and buying houses like cash unseen, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, you can't fault someone, for, you know, if they have the money buying cash and get a better deal. But then people like in Texas, all those small places like that, that's small, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Or kind of like getting driven out of the market, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, the cash, the cash buyer, uh, that's tough to compete with, uh, you know, and especially in the last several years, we see a lot of cash buyers. And so, you know, like one of the things I talk about a lot is how this middle income affordability crisis, housing affordability crisis is kind of the responsibility for all of us, um, everyone in, you know, so in part, it's saying, hey, seller, yes, there might be a little bit more risk in going with a financed offer. You know, it might be worth considering. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure everyone's like, you know, you know, I'm gonna sell my house to, you know, the whatever, you know, a veteran or a single parent or whatever the case may be, or like, you know, I want, I don't want to take our cash offer. That cash offer in your, in your in your face, and it's a damn good cash offer. Is like, okay, you know, like self interest takes over, greed takes over, which you know, it is what it is, right? Yeah, totally normal. And you know, I would say, I don't think sellers should be in a position where they're like donating proceeds to a buyer mm. but if everything else is equal and the buyer has strong you know approval in their financing and it's going to be the same final dollar amount for the seller i would hope that some sellers would be um, a little more amenable to considering a financed offer yeah. yeah so is buying a house even the american dream anymore you know first everything's out price you know out price and i heard like so many millennials and younger generations talk about you know what I don't want the house of a house. Like I'd rather like live downtown, be convenient. You know, I ain't got time to cut the grass and do, you know, lawn maintenance and, you know, repairs. Yep. Is this like a dynamic that's changing and we don't realize it? Well, that's a great question. I like that a lot. So, you know, millennials, I think millennials are the largest generation ever. Mm -hmm. And you're right. Like a ton of them don't want to own houses. But one of the things, and I can't remember where I read this and I wish I could, but it was talking about millennials are starting to head into home ownership because of their pets. Like they want their dog to have a yard <laughs> you know what actually it makes a lot of sense because like i think i'm making this up probably i think they have the higher highest percentage of, of pet ownership versus any other generation i would bet they do i would bet they do and and you know the other thing is that we know historically home ownership has been one of the biggest wealth building blocks in america um 
but to go back, is it still the American dream? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure. Um, I think it's still a good idea. And if it's not the American dream, I might, I might tend to think maybe it's because they got priced out of it. Yeah. Or they were very anti what their parents were into. So I'm not sure which. Yeah. I know. I, when I was growing up, everyone said buy a house. It's a great investment. But I recently, um, several people, including I think Greg Cardone, have been saying like, no, don't buy a house. It's not a good investment, right? Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Uh, I think it's a great investment. I, I really do. And I think it's, you know, over the long term, I think it's a great investment. I know, you know, looking back to my grandparents, the, the single biggest thing they had for their wealth, which was, you know, they were not wealthy, was their house, yeah. right? And they were really proud of it. And they lived there until they paid it off. And and that's where they had, you know, the wealth. They didn't have a savings account or 401k. They had pensions, which was great, but. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I know how that turned out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Off topic. It's funny how, like, you know, like a lot of corporations, like on the drop of a dime, they got rid of everyone's pension. Oh, we don't pay you nothing. But now they're like, oh, workers are so disloyal. I'm like, get out of here, right? Are you are, are you hearing what you're saying, right? Are you just like pretty much like got rid of everyone's pensions and like all that kind of stuff at a drop of a hat for the, for the company interest, right? But and now they're disloyal. Get out, get out of here, like. You know, if I hear the term record profits one more time, I'm oh my goodness, fall yeah. over. It's my husband and I were talking about this last night. We're talking about just it, just the conflicting messages out there, right? The rich get richer, mm -hmm. and um. And, and, you know, you know, people don't want to work and there's all of these yeah. things. And one of the things we were talking about last night is, again, record profits. And yet people, you know, I know so many organizations that are not even doing cost of living adjustment yeah. raises. So the raises are losing money. Raises. Yeah, they're losing money. They're losing yeah. money. And uh, one of the things that, you know, like the 40 hour work week, which is just kind of a joke because everybody's actually expected to work like way more than that. Yeah. Um, or, or, the, or, the, or the verse in, you know, stats show. If you're at the office 40 hours a week, you're you mainly like, you might be working 20 hours a week, but like, then you're on Facebook talking to people, right? You're not really doing 40 hours. A week. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it depends on what the job is too. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, this is, oh gosh, this is just such a, we could go in so many different directions here, but it's, you know, I kind of look at it like, here's the job, do this. Yeah. And if you do it, then fine, go on Facebook for the rest of that. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. yeah. Or another instance, like you have a, like you give someone a kind of get someone something to do, right? Like th you give two, two people doing the same job, pretty much like we'll say social media, we'll say sales mark, what it is. They have each like four tasks to do in, in, in like eight hours. One person takes them eight hours, right? This is what he's supposed to do. Other person, he gets it done in three hours. The boss has said, Hey, great job. You know, go do whatever you want to do. They give them more fucking tasks to do. Right. So we don't start saying, you know, the reward for doing a good job is getting more work. Yeah. So it's like, okay, like why, why? I, that's not understandable for me. Like now, if you give me work and me more pay, yeah, I got it. But like, agree. Yeah, I think it should just be based on here's the job. You know, do this job. I don't care how long it takes you. Yep. <laughs> you know, I don't care. Work, work from there. Work from here. Work for ten hours. Work for forty. Just get this piece done. Yeah. Um, now, if you can't get it done in like eight hours, then we have a problem, right? Because like that's you know that's be some kind of minimum standards. Yeah, I think so. I think a conversation would need to take place, you know, especially if you know it can be, you know. Oh, yeah. Like if you've set out a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. It's, uh, like, especially like you're a startup founder, you're like, I've done this myself before. I'm not an expert at it, but I did this like, what is like six hours, right? You're supposed to be the expert. You're like, if you come back, say it takes you 12 hours. This, there's a problem here, right? right. Like, what's, what's going on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, it's kind of like sometimes when you're hiring a, but somebody that's like, oh, you know, I'm going to quote this job. It's going to take six hours. And then it takes six hours, right? And it's kind of, and let's just pretend it's like a dishwasher repair, right? I actually don't care if it takes six hours. Yeah. Just, is it a hundred dollars to fix my dishwasher? Great. Yeah. Do it in five minutes. Yeah. Well done. High five. Exactly. Excellent. I can start washing my dishes in my dishwasher. Yeah. yeah. You can go. Like we've all heard the, 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 um, what's the call? Mike gets locked out of the car. And so they call him for coach. One person says, you know, hundred dollars. I get to do two hours, you know. Finally, one course says, you know, $1,000 for five minutes. Like $1,000. Other guy said, like, 100 or whatever. Like, I've been doing this for 20 years. You, you know, I can, I, do you want to be in your car in a minute or do you want to wait like an hour, right? Yeah. It's yeah. up to you. Like, yeah. So that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so let's suppose, like, you know, a husband and wife have bought a house, they paid it off. Uh, let's say they have four, like, we'll say four kids, right? And, and somehow they both die at the same time. How should that, couple in their world divide this house they give the oldest like they 
they say sell the house, divide the money up, or like how does that work? Because I, I would think, you know, four kids grew up in a house, you know, maybe have green, that's a lot of sentimental value, right? I think, I mean, I can see a lot of like, people like going like, I won't say the war, but like, you know, having a conflict, like the house was mine. No, you know, I lived in the most or, you know, like how yeah. that, how do you, what's the recommendation on that kind of stuff? Well, that's tough, right? Because boy, I, I think we've all seen, you know, death bring out the worst in family members. Um, my husband and I, we have four kids between us and, uh, you know, kids, if you don't know this already, you're each getting a quarter. That's how it's working out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I don't even know any other way to do it than just here, here, you know, here's a high level, here's the equal split. You know, yeah, maybe it's more fair to somebody and not the other, but that's, you know, I don't see it. But then what do you do? Like one kid, like, you know, I want to keep the house. I want to raise my kids like you raised me. And like, you know, one kid might be like, hey, I want this to be the generation home, like all the retox, this is our home forever and yeah. ever, right? Uh, boy, I don't know, buy your siblings out or, you know, that's uh, a good point. Yeah. You know, buy your siblings out or, or convince them that, you know, you guys should keep the house as an investment property for long term and, mm -hmm. you know, sell it down the road for the grandkids. But when that time's gone, you're, you and your husband be gone. Like that's, that's on y'all. Like, yeah. that's, that's what I can do Not about my that. Problem. <laughs> <laughs> my problem. Yeah. You're so lucky you got a house to split up. Yeah. <laughs> so how many people actually pay their house out off? I, I mean, 30 years. Money. 30 years is a long time, right? And a lot of people refinance to do HELOCs and stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. before you know it, crap, I'm 87 years old. I'm still paying on my house, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't think, you know, I I think it's very few people, honestly. Mm -hmm. I And I think that used to be different. Um, you know, like I said, you know, my grandparents paid their house off. But my grandparents didn't move every five years. Like, they yeah. bought it and lived there for 50 years. Yeah. And that was it. Um, but, you know, I think... I think the regular middle income, regular person probably doesn't pay their house off. And what, what happens then to like, does that dad just pass on to their kids or like? How... Yeah, it does. It does. So that'd be, that'd be like a nice surprise. we in the world. Oh, by the way, your parents <laughs> owe $325,000 on his house. First payments due June 1st. Yep. Who gets the bill? Oldest, second, third, you know. That's, see, there's an easy decision to sell. <laughs> let's, let's put it on the market and get yeah. this debt. Um, although, you know, I'm in my fifties now, I can say that I'm kind of more interested in like looking at the not owing money on mm -hmm. a house versus, yeah. you know, I don't want to, I don't want to start a new mortgage. Yeah. That sounds, sounds terrible. Any parent wants to like burden their kids, like this big ass mortgage, you know, exactly. exactly. <laughs> you always wonder how, uh, me and your, 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 me and your dad, or me and your wife could go on these fancy vacations every year. This is why yep. we're like 20 equity loans <laughs> out. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, and people do, you know, they tap into that. And it's, you know, it kind of goes back to, you know, this wealth building thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are choosing to tap into that wealth before they, you yeah. know, are- I mean, why not enjoy your life, right? Like, yeah. you know, I think there's, cool there's definitely a lot of pros and cons. Yeah. But you probably need to, you need to discuss at least your kids or someone, you know, like. Yeah. And the good thing, you know, that's so hard. It's, your kid and yeah. something. but then again it's like I, you know and like, some kids like you know like your house might be in seattle they live in like denver colorado like i'm not moving back to seattle just to live in this house you know or somebody might be like sentimental value like you know just some of your variables to you know yeah well and in seattle now you know if a family has owned a house for decades mm -hmm. it's a gold mine oh yeah oh my goodness yeah. yeah i mean it is literally in the millions of dollars likely yeah. right at least one million you yeah. know <laughs> um and that's crazy to me to think that just a regular old house is a million I bucks. I have a friend, I think his house is in Barron, right? It's like, it was made in 74, 75, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's like, has a, it doesn't have a car, it has a carport. It was like inside, it's still like 70 style, like they, they, they never remodeled, you know? He, I think it's been like so four times that my friend's in it now. He said like, it's worth like 925,000. Isn't that crazy? I'm like, what? There's no way. This, he said, no, 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 no offense, my God, but $925,000, what are you doing, right? Like. But then again, if you sell the house, how are you gonna buy another one, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's yeah. Unless you plan to move in, like you know, the South or you know Idaho or Kansas or something like that, right? You gotta move further out to you know to not spend the the million dollars. I mean, it just it's boggling to me that how quickly the home prices have increased. It, but it's um, you know it's challenging too because people are priced out of Seattle, and you know they gotta go further out. So what is, what's, I know you're, you're being like, what does it mean for accessibility for homeowners? So accessibility for homeowners in, in the providing a path to homeownership where they didn't have one before. So, you know, like I was saying, 
a, a moment ago that a lot of folks are just priced out of homes now because they can't catch up to a down payment amount or the closing costs. And closing costs are, there's this, there's this expense that kind of surprises a lot of potential homeowners. And it's not like a hundred dollar bill. It's like, it's kind of, you know, up there. Yeah, it's thousands of dollars, you know, it's, it's thousands of dollars, you know, in, in the, you know, two-ish percent range of a home price to, to, to pay to borrow money <laughs> to buy the really expensive house. So the accessibility pieces, we're just giving them access to home ownership by helping guide them through the down payment grant program, or we pay their closing costs. Um, and the other thing we do is we, we provide a lot of education up front. Because it's not about necessarily getting everybody into home ownership, but getting people that are qualified into home ownership and helping them sustain, responsibly sustain home ownership, right? You know, there was a point seeing out mortgages like Mardi Gras beads, right? That turned out to be problematic. So we don't want to do that, right? We don't want to get folks into homes that can't afford it or can't sustain home ownership. So we want to make sure we've got some, you know, education piece up front and guide them through the process and um, help them get into a home if they can afford it and sustain it. So that's the accessibility piece. Okay. So I'm a retired army officer. So I don't have to pay, if you loans, I have to go pay anything down. So I don't have to do the PMI insurance, right? I can be wrong, but it almost seems like, you know, making people pay 20% down and the mortgage insurance, almost like a way to like, you know, keep middle income and poor people out of homes, right? Is yeah. that is that how that started or, or just off base? Well, no, I think, it, I think that's exactly it. I mean, the bank's, um, kind of rule the world, right? And so, and that that just is terrible. So 20% down, right? Or you're stuck paying mortgage insurance, which is hundreds of dollars a month. It's not a small amount, which then affects your debt to income. Which and then, then if you miss either the mortgage or the mortgage insurance, it's still a, a, a hit, right? Oh, yeah. And it's, it it's you know, you're just paying the bank more to borrow the money. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, um, you know, honestly, I think, you know, what I said, this, there's so many solutions to the housing affordability crisis, but banks could do a little bit more, I think, you know, it's like, well, we do this because of safety and risk and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But you if, know. You're, if, if you really did your due diligence, you know, maybe you shouldn't have sold a $300,000 house to someone who works at McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, they, the folks go through the same qualifying process, right? And have got them bill that once or twice yeah so maybe we could not you know penalize first-time home buyers with this mortgage insurance yeah. or you know we can we can give them a great rate even though they're not putting 20 percent down mm -hmm. because you know the 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 buyer that's coming in without the big down payment or maybe the super high credit score due to whatever reason but not necessarily negligence yeah. they're paying a higher interest rate i mean they're just paying more and more and more to the banks for the banks to make more money and i Again, I get risk, but <coughs> but come on now, there, there's more that can be done. What's your take on homeowners associations? Like, of course, of course, this is a good new way because they keep they keep someone like you know having like three junk cars on the front lawn. Again, some rules you hear like you know you can't have a flag up here, you can't have this color, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then is it true like if you miss your HOA payment, they can actually like like cancel your mortgage or something like that? Like, how much power does HOAs really have? Well, it depends. Um, you know in part, you'd have to miss a lot of HOA paints and then they could put a lien on your house. Um, like, I won't say a nonprofit, basically like a nonprofit organization can, has that much power, right? You're like, I, just, yeah. just, I don't know. But they sign up for it, right? So if you buy into Yeah, I mean, it's true, right? I mean, I bought my house down at DuPont as part of the agreement, you know, you're going to put the home organization, blah, 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 I just, I don't know, there's something that seems, is the user reward is something that seems icky about it. I'm not a fan myself. So I have not ever lived in a, in an area with a homeowners association um, because I don't know, there's just something I'm like, you know, this is my house. I'm going to fly whatever flag I want. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, you know, looking across the street, it's like, man, I wish that that neighbor didn't have all those cars out front. Yeah. Right. I know. Right. Yeah. I know. I read or heard something recently where there's one HOA, they were actually using drones to fly over people's house, look in the backyards and stuff. Now to me, that seems highly legal, right? Like, so they, they said this one person got fined because they had a, they put something in the backyard that was, supposed, I, was like, I won't say a deck or maybe a jacuzzi, it was something they were right. And I, behind, there was nobody behind their house, you're right, it's like a forest, so they, they, you know, so they got a fine for having this, you know, un, undocumented, un, what do you want to call it, sunk. I'm like, 
So you you flew a drone? Like, come on now. Like, that's a bit far, right? I think that's a little bit far, right? And then it kind of goes back to the, like, who cares? Like, yeah. there's nobody behind them, right? Yeah. Somebody's just being a jerk. Yeah. Right? I mean, who's affected by, I mean, I don't know exactly what it was, right? But if you need to fly a drone over yeah. to prove that the thing happened, yeah, maybe it's not a big deal. That's something like something good, like, you know, like if it's like Christmas and some guy has like, 10,000 boat, you know, Christmas lights that shine to the moon. Well, maybe the OHA, HOA needs to shut that down, right. you know, unless all the neighbors like do it. Like, like in, in my neighborhood every year for Halloween, there's one house on the, on this corner, like two blocks. Like, it's like, it's like a horror movie in the front yard, right? <laughs> so many dead walking around the movie show. Like it's, it's, it's crazy, but it's, it's nice, you know, but everyone looks forward to it, but. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, you know, like if you back up a couple of decades, you should just go talk to your neighbor. Yeah, those are days are long over, unfortunately. I know, and that kind of sucks because now we've got these homeowner associations or whatever and mediators and stuff. You know. Well, yeah, gosh, I just I wish we could just go talk to our neighbors and be like, "Hey, your light's shining in my window, and I can't sleep." And oh, sorry, I'll turn it off at night. Yeah. Yeah. Here's something else that changed. Like you know, back in the day, if you're, you're at home with your family, someone knocking on the door. We got company. Go see who it is, right? <laughs> who is? Oh man, Tom. Tom and his wife. Man, we haven't seen him for a while. Come by, sit down. Yeah, yeah. Like we can make you some coffee. Want to drink? Like, how much time you got? Oh, we're just in the neighborhood. I'm going to stop by, say hello, see how the kids are doing. And for you know, like you're talking, watching something two hours. Nowadays, someone knocks your door. Like, do you invite someone over? Like, duck below the window. <laughs> like, <laughs> did, did anyone invite anyone? Like, what's going on? Right? Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. you got to make appointments. Like, you know, the days are dropping by to see anyone are long gone, right? You got to make an appointment and then like, oh, hey, you got to text. I'm, I'm here now. You know, don't shoot me. I'm coming. Right? That's, you know, it's uh, uh, so good exciting when people knock on my door. Like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's open some wine. You know, yeah. I don't have anything to eat, but maybe, you know, here's some croutons. Or, you know, we can order a pizza or whatever. And um, I still love that so much. Yeah. But like my kids, I'm like, yeah, don't. No. Don't don't if they don't know you're, you're coming, you better you know call them and let them know. Oh. So I was at home, right? And I heard this noise and I looked at the window. It's like this truck drove in the driveway, right? I'm like, what in the world's going on? Like you just gonna randomly drive go to my driveway. So I'm like peeking around, like, you know, and they knocked. I of course I ignored it. And then like I see them to leave like 20 minutes later and they had left like some bingo tickets for my wife, right? From the HRA, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. They're like, who's this random person? Like who who is a daffy like driving it parking anyone's driveway right like parking the street like a normal person right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you, you wonder now right I mean there's just so many there's so many things that have changed and there's just so much I don't know unpleasantness right now that it's tough so let's talk about sales um talk about how in the past you like you, all your teams like exceeded all your sales targets like how did that come about well so 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 when I was at larger organizations, I had really big sales teams. Um, right now, we're we're a small crew. Nobody has the sales quota or anything. Everybody just does what they want to do, sort of, right? It's it's everybody gets to kind of all your workers like we can do whatever we want to do. We're wrong with that. <laughs> kind of, yeah, it's you know because there's just um, just because of the way that real estate is structured. So we're very you know, we're kind of set up in make as much or as little as you want. You know, you want to work more? Awesome. Go work more. You want to work less? Great. That's fine. You know, you just get paid less. Um, but if I back up to, you know, former organizations that I was at, um, you know, it's always been a passion of mine, like the whole work-life balance thing, which is kind of a myth, but I think, you know, I think people excel when you give them the room to excel. And um, so I think that's where the success came from. But it was, it took a long time to figure that stuff out. And I never actually figured it out. I think maybe I just got lucky in the end. So I'm guessing you can't be a success in real estate without being like some kind of base knowledge in sales, right? Yeah, maybe, you know, it's, you know, you're really just guiding people through a process, right? I mean, I think, I think to be successful in real estate, there's a lot that goes into it. Number one, you've got to be, um, you've got to be knowledgeable of the market, right? And the contract. I mean, that's kind of the the bare bones of guiding somebody through this very large purse purchase. But 
the client, like there's two different pieces, right? There's like the, the, the contract, you know, guidance, that piece. And then there's the drumming up business piece, right? And sometimes the person that's really successful at drumming up business is really kind of just a mediocre agent, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's great if you can marry the two together and, you know, somebody is really great at getting business and guiding clients well. So you have like over 20 years experience doing this kind of stuff. From your point of view, what makes someone like a really good or even great real estate person? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, so, you know, I think, I think somebody is really good when they put their client's needs before their own. Um, I think, and I think in order to do that, you're looking at, you know, what's best for the client. Like, what do I bring to this? What can I bring to this versus what am I getting from this? And, and I think that's just such a, a different mindset. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, I got into real estate because you can make so much money. Um, yeah, you can, but that's kind of a crappy way to go about like having that be your mindset. Because I think if you can look at all of your transactions as what can I bring to this? How can I help these people? And then the money piece just comes together in the end, right? It's over there. It falls in place. But I think that's what makes a good agent is putting the client before the, themselves. So this is such a presume that since most real estate people have to work weekends, open a house, stuff like that, they're, 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 they're like pretty much like they take off two days during the week to compensate the house for it. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the thing with real estate too, is people just, they work when they want. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, um, if you don't want to work and I, I have a ton of people that don't want to work weekends, you know, I know a ton of real estate people that don't want to work week weekends. And one of the things that some people do, and one of the things that we'll, we do for our brokers is we'll have like newer real estate agents that are just kind of getting started. We'll have them go out and show houses or attend open houses or do things like that to support the more. Uh, experienced agent or or the people that want to take a weekend off you know it's kind of just sharing the load um, and everybody wants to do it a little bit differently you know you want to work a weekend awesome go for it you don't okay we can figure out how to take care of the client another way so how does one become a real estate agent it's like I mean, you have to have a college degree a certain test i mean like how do you and then you always like real estate with all these like little letters after the name what's all that kind of stuff about <laughs> so um so to get a real estate license, you just have to do some real estate school. I think it's 90 hours right now. Maybe it's 100. I think it's 90 hours in Washington. Um, but it's really, you could just do it online over the, you know, you just do the, the clock hours and then you take a state exam and then you're a real estate agent. So does this frustrate you? Like, let's suppose like there's somebody, you know, and they've been like, you know, 20 years they've done, you know, I, I suppose they've been a plumber for 20 years, right? And all of a sudden, like, I'm going to be a real estate real agent. And they take the test, and now they're on a real estate agent. Like, there's, like, kind of first, like, you know, like, this is my life's work. Um, and you just, like, randomly take this test, and then you can start selling like houses. Like, no, come on now. Like, we need some more kind of professionalism here, right? To some degree, yes. I mean, you know, I actually love new agents because it's, like, there's so much to to share with mm -hmm. them, right? It's, um, but it's, But yeah, some it of them are, like, you know, oh, like you said, I'll, I'll, I'll be rich being a real estate agent, you know, and, like, they think you just take this random test and then pop a sign up and, oh, I'm making a million dollars in sales a month, right? Yeah, there's that. And, you know, I've, I've interviewed hundreds of real estate agents over my the course of my career. And, you know, it's so funny. And you meet so many people like, oh, I love houses. I think I'll be a realtor. I'm like, <laughs> I love my car, but I'm not going to be a mechanic, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I think sometimes people don't realize how much goes into it you know it's not really just touring houses and taking pictures of cool living rooms yeah so my son-in-law he's a real estate agent doing like i think six seven years i'm making that up probably about it he told me like we first started like yeah, like he was like just a cold calling knock on people's doors all that kind of stuff now he's the point where like you know he gets referrals he doesn't yeah. do the stuff now but he first started like he's like man this shit sucks yeah yeah like who, like why am i gonna let you sell my house like who are you right you've done nothing you know yeah and so you got to get someone to trust you at first right and then build up your capacity yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. It's hard at first. It's hard at first. And, you know, um, a lot of folks get get going in real estate, like when when the market's really hot and they do really well, and then the market takes a downturn and it's not quite as easy. Um, and so, you know, it's, I don't know, you know, I think in a profession, there's, there's folks that are really good and so yeah. 
So try some snail worm. I'll try a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I'll probably make a face because that's no worries. Happens. Yeah. Um, are you doing this? So this is my opinion, right? Like, you know, you no matter how bad the economy is, real estate people always say now's the time to buy a home, right? Mm -hmm. It could be high interest, low interest, you know, good, bad economy. I've never heard a real estate person. Now is not the time to buy. Like, <laughs> like, you know, they always like spin it, so to speak. Right. You know, like, buy those buy a house now, you know, interest will be low or buy the house now because you know the market's gonna explode right or, or like why do you really say agents first of all am i wrong i really say people always say buy now versus you might want to hold off a bit you know right right um i think you're right i think that is said a lot first cheers, cheers. thanks for coming thank you for having me i'm gonna sniff it for a minute um so one of the things that i like to to tell people is you know the right time to buy a house is when it's right for you mm -hmm. It's usually that, that's such great advice right there. I, it, that's such good advice. Like, yeah, it's life. It's it, it, is it right time in your life to buy a house? And if it is, then fine. Mm -hmm. If the interest rates are high, guess what? They're going to come down at some point. If they're low, high yeah. five. Lucky you. But life dictates dictates the purchase, right? Because <laughs> we can all sit here all day long and create reasons to buy. Yeah, in any situation. Like we 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 bought a house to Dupont, right? We moved a. Fort Lewis here in 2009, the housing market was like trash, right? But I was like, you know what? Like, we've never bought a house before. We're going to be here like at least three years. Like, we're, <laughs> we're going to buy a house. Yeah. Like, of course, we did like, you know, do the APR thing. And then later on, refinance the lower interest rate, you know. Of course, there's some risk in doing that too, you know, right? What if interest rates don't, don't go down, yeah. right? But and, and I, in my mind, a house, right? Mm -hmm. Unless it makes me like, now I'm not going to buy no, like, thousand square foot house for a million dollars you know but like it, it's you lose your price you know yeah it, <coughs> but yeah the the you know it's hard um again the life di dictates the purchase but it's the uh, the interest rate thing is so hard too right because that is really hard to guide people because especially when folks are like wow you, you know i'll just refinance and historically the rates will come down again but I would be like, you know, I would be really thoughtful about buying a house at a high interest rate if you're going to be struggling mm -hmm. to make those payments. Because that can get really <laughs> uncomfortable really fast. And the joy of home ownership gets sucked right out of life if you're struggling. So and recently with the Fed, like it's not like they've increased interest rate like 20,000 times the last three months, right? Like every time, like, like come on, guy, like you're like. <sighs> Oh my God. Can you at least wait another day or something, right? It's been so brutal. Oh my gosh. I mean, I've had clients like start the, the process before, like I had these clients that started last spring uh, and literally it took about six months for them to, to finally settle on a house and the house they purchased, great house, but their payment <laughs> Just in that, maybe it was seven months, but in that time period between when they first got qualified and when they actually bought the house, their payment changed by like $1,800 a month. Like it was significant. That's insane. It was so. Uh, to crazy. me, that'd be a deal breaker. Oh my gosh. Well, and there was so much that went into it too, because, um, uh, you know, it was the interest rates. Number one was a big deal, but also, um, they, there was the student loan, um, <laughs> wiping out the student loan debt yeah like, that's another debt, thing yeah. yeah and then you know that didn't happen in time for their purchase so, so many people got their hopes up and they got uh, debt and they got dashed yeah 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 it's so it's it's been painful but now of course you get a loan you want to get the lowest interest rate you can but does the bank you use really matter like suppose like the same two different banks have the same interest rate does a bank or financial institution credit you know whatever case may be really matter with the loan I think it does. Yeah, okay. I think it does. And, um, you know, I won't name names because that seems like a bad idea. Um, but I think they're, you know, I think it kind of goes like with anything, you know, work with somebody that, that you kind of get along with, mm -hmm. you know, this is going to, this is a really important purchase. Trust your loan officer. Um, I have worked with some large lending institutions that you know, the rules are the rules are the rules. That's just what they are. They're, Everything's they're, black and white. It's black and white. There's no <laughs> one to talk to. This is the way it is. Da, da, da. And sometimes smaller institutions, there's, you know, you can kind of 
talk to somebody. Or the bigger banks that are really with you all the way. But once you sign a dollar line, customer service comes an automated bot answering machine. Mm -hmm. And you can never get the real person. Yeah. Or or something will come up to that's challenging. Like, uh, you know, like, I don't know, like your appraisal comes in low or or just some unique or uncommon thing will, will come up. And again, the rules are the rules. And I have found that sometimes it's easier working with more flexible institutions <laughs> to, to go through that stuff. So tell me, what do you do for fun? Oh, well, um, I like to sail. My husband and I just got a sailboat in February. So that's been a new fun thing. Um, I, gosh, I should be prepared for this. <laughs> you know, um, I like I like hanging out with people. Mm. I like talking about stuff. I'm a political junkie, which everybody in my household hates. I'm actually not allowed to talk politics in my house except for one day a month, and I only get an hour on that one day, unless something really exciting has happened, and then I get a given bonus time. Um, I like to drink wine. I love to eat. I like to cook. Um I really want to say like I like to work out, but I don't. <laughs> uh, I feel like I should say something healthy. <laughs> um, I don't hike. Um, like people say, I wake up in the morning, meditate for twenty minutes. Yeah. I, I go a ten mile hike, you know, <laughs> before dawn. You know, I'm with the one with nature, and I come back and crush it all day long. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I want to do. Like I wake up, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to touch my phone for like twenty minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. And you barely last two seconds. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, what time? Oh. Well, I got a notification. I should see what that is. So I'm the early morning dopamine. Yeah, I'm terrible at that. And uh, but you know, it's I always like it. Like we go on a hike or we go on a walk. But you know, I'm not going to like go buy some special shoes for yeah. it or anything. It's yeah. um, I don't know. I think I'm pretty chill most of all. Just, what, what, what kind of food do you like cooking? Like if someone said like, it, we'll give you a million dollars. You have to. Cook the, you, Ooh, boy. like this meal has, will get you a million dollars. Oh, that would be so hard. Mm, I don't think I'm that good of a cook, but <laughs> I would try. Um, you know, my kids would say spicy pasta just because it's what they grew up on. Um, I think I make this pork shank dish uh -huh. with a cherry sauce that's really, really good. And then I do. I have this risotto that I love to make. Okay. Is leek and uh, roasted onions. Nice. Um, but my husband is Swiss Italian, so he working in our house because he's just so darn good at it. You know, that's like cooking mac and cheese yeah. for for a you know Washington girl. Like you know, craft mac and cheese mm -hmm. is what I grew <laughs> up cooking. He grew up cooking like risotto and yeah. fabulousness. And yeah, in the army, we were stationed in Italy for two years in a town called Vicenza, like thirty minutes east, thirty minutes west of Venice. Oh, okay. So my wife learned how to cook all the stuff right. Other, uh, I can't even say the names like risotto and lasagna. Like, um, it's one thing that like is noodles, like roast, like spicy tomatoes. I can't remember what it's called. I said my name, but I, my mind, I can't pronounce it. Like all this stuff, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the, uh, the arrabbiata. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's it, right? That's the, that's my spicy pasta. That's it. That's Yeah. <laughs> like whenever the kids come visit us or whatever, like that's the first thing they ask her to cut it, cook this, right? Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my son, our, my youngest graduates tomorrow. Uh, and on the menu is uh, spicy pasta mm -hmm. and then a, uh, a pavlova for dessert. Okay. Because, uh, it's beautiful and everybody loves have, it. Have y'all been to Italy to visit? Yeah, yeah. Um, so my husband grew up in southern Switzerland and he left. Switzerland is such a beautiful country. So pretty. And like we actually drive from like Italy up to Germany for business, army right. And like we always pass this lake on the left, right? It is just so beautiful, right? Oh my gosh. It is so pretty. We, uh, you know, we, he doesn't get back as often as he would like to, but we went back <clears throat> in 2021 and we ended up getting COVID, mm -hmm. which you know, so you had to stay there. So we had to stay there. What do you mean? I mean, there's coarse places to be stuck at. And you know, so first of all, we had a decent COVID experience, right? Fortunately, but we still had to stay there. So yeah. our two week trip turned into a month. Yeah. And my husband had the best trip back home that he's had in decades because we couldn't see anyone for two weeks. Yeah. So there was nobody vying for his time. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. We we're just in this cool Airbnb just hanging out, you know, um, driving around and seeing sites that he hasn't done in years. Mm -hmm. And then 
And then we got to spend the second two weeks, you know, after we were healed, seeing all the people. Yeah. Um, but it was so crazy because, you know, there's a stress period, like, oh my gosh, we're like we're stuck in, oh well, we're stuck in Switzerland. This is not terrible. This is not okay. this is not terrible. Like it's okay. We could actually be stuck in like in an airport, you know, just go. Right. Yeah, it was fine. Oh, we could be actually quarantined in some hotel in Japan, like they were doing, you know, like you can't see anyone. Yeah. And they and they serve your food under the t door, or something crazy. Yeah. Well, so we we don't know where we got COVID, but we, you know, we did all the tests and everything because back then you still had to, you know, do the test before you flew and everything, and that was fine. I think we picked it up like somewhere between Seattle and yeah. And, who knows, right? Yeah, we have no idea, but we, my husband got it immediately. So like it, it was. Like we we landed and we were like there for five minutes. Yeah. My thing is like, how many people have COVID now that don't realize it, right? Because no one's getting tested, right? Like, yeah, you might you know might have other systems, you know, like who knows, right? Yeah. And one thing about overseas, especially like Europe, like Italy, Switzerland, like people have no idea how the food tastes so much better over there, right? Mm -hmm. For example, something like McDonald's. So every once in a while, I have to take my army unit from Italy up to Germany, right? Would like would like drive with them buses or whatever. Would always stop at this uh, McDonald's in Switzerland. It was right across the border from Italy to switch, like right there, right? Yeah. And that McDonald's, like, it was like gourmet food. It, it, it tasted so good. Like, this is an American McDonald's, right? Yeah. All those are like, sir, we had to stop this McDonald's, right? Yeah. What are you talking about? It was so good, right? Yeah, so, it's not funny. Yeah. I was in um, I was in New Zealand, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. And um, the fast food is different, right? It's totally different. But in New Zealand, they have lamb burgers at oh, all wow. the fast food places because, you know, they eat lamb. Mm -hmm. And I wish I would have taken a picture of this billboard. This is totally not the same thing, but it was funny. But, um, you know, it was this, it was like Burger King, I think, advertising this lamb burger. And it was like, it was like a far side cartoon. I yeah, like your mind's was, blown. Yeah. I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> what is that very funny billboard that's probably like it would be totally inappropriate in the u.s like people yeah. would lose their minds oh yeah you, it, you, you're killing lambs oh my gosh but it was so funny and but i didn't take a picture of it yeah. and you know now i forgot what it looked like but but yeah it's so different it is so different the food's so different like i like i tell people like in italy time you're italy we never had a bad meal like we were like going like lunch or dinner or whatever you get, you get the house wine like this is your house wine like how good is the actual like wine you're selling for money right right like man I, i'm good with this right yeah yeah i know well and i always think you know, I think wine tastes better when you're traveling yeah. and you're just having wine from where you're at. Like I've never had a bad glass of wine, Oh no, yeah. you know, like in Italy or something. It's always like, yeah, this is great. Yeah. And so we live like this little village in Italy when I was stationed in the military. And so my kids, I mean, I think they were like seventh grade, first in kindergarten, something like that. Right. So they would take the bus on base, go to school, they come back every day. My wife would pick them up, right. Take them a little gelato, gelato store, give them some gelato. And every day she would try to, she, she had to walk by the landlord's house, get her house right. Every day the landlord's wife would like grab her. Like, I made you a little snack. It'd be like, like big ass pasta meal for right. tomatoes she picked from the, from the, you know, from the backyard, right? Yes. Yes. Isn't it? It's, so, it's just a different way of life. Yeah. How long were you there? Uh, two, two years. Okay. Yeah. Was, oh, yeah. what a great experience. Yeah. It was a great experience, right? Wow. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Good times. So next year, you're a political junkie. A little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, like my personal opinion, like as a country, whether you're Republican, Democrat, liberal, whatever your label is, like we have to do better than Biden Trump 2024. Like oh, where, with that and can someone below the age of 60 please run? Oh boy. Like Trump 77, Biden 82, like it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. Gotta look for 2028. We're yeah, I mean, like because on the Democratic side, I mean, like no one's really running. Of course, no one runs your sitting president, but my thing is like, they're not even doing debates on the Democratic side. The DNC cancels all debates. Like, because they're like, to me, it's like saying, okay, we're going to take the risk of Biden saying something stupid, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's keep him off. But then again, I don't know who's even going to run against him, you know? I don't know if there's anybody's yeah. going to see him run because usually don't, you know, sitting presidents have like competition, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anybody's going to run run against him. It's going to come, it's going to come in 2028. I think Gavin Newsom's going to run in 2028. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know who else. That's my only. That's my only bet. In, in 2024, the public side is like a free for all. Right? Of course, Trump's like the, the big guy, but no, how's the felony convictions? Well, not he's not convicted yet, but how's all that play out? You know, of course, people are like so-called Trumpers. They're gonna even dig in deeper, you know. Yeah. And then like, DeSantis is doing a lot of stuff. Some people, of course, pretty important. It's crazy, not crazy. 
like the mayor of Miami's running for president oh, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw that. You it's know, and then like, um, I need to learn more about Nikki. I, I know some about Nikki Haley. I need to learn about her. I, I, I think I like Nikki Haley. I'm not sure about the guy from uh, South Carolina, Tim Scott. I mean, you know, yeah, he's like real pro American conservative. You know, basically he's running as like anti liberal right, which can be good and bad. You know, and like random people like this, the mayor, of, not the mayor, the, the the governor from North Dakota. Like, mm-hmm. really? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, you talk about a long shot, right? I would think, I would think the mayor from Miami has a better chance than the guy from North Dakota, right? You know, it's I don't even know what to think about all of the options on the other side. You I mean, really think we're just got to buckle in. Suck it up, so to speak, right? <laughs> we got a few years together, <laughs> and uh, and I think we'll see. I think in 2028 is when we're going to see a return to more normal. Yeah. You know, normal. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to Republican debates. Like, can you imagine like Trump out there cussing people out, Mike Spence going after him? You know, like, like me, I, I blame the media for getting Trump elected right back in 2016, right? Oh, yeah. Because you know. You really didn't have a case. I mean, like, you know, like um clickbait thing. They were like, like advertise, you know, like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, I think one of our things right now, like, I think one of the biggest problems we have right now is we're all so stinking polite. And that's a good point. You know, there was a time like in my 20s, maybe in my 30s, um, you know, you'd have your friends over and, and you're having some cocktails and you're, you're respectfully disagreeing with, with each other, you know, about policy yeah. and, 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 you know, basic stuff. That was great. You know, you got to have conversations like across the dinner table from your friends. And then we got into this weird divisive, I don't know, like, you know, I don't want to get into politics. I don't want to talk about this yeah. or that, right? But I think we lost something in not having those conversations with the people we care about the most. Yeah. You know, we should be able to disagree. Or they go on Twitter on an anonymous name and, you know, bash people, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And then it brings us like ugliness, like even to people's relationships. And it's like, you know, you can back, you know, and we can discuss these things you know yeah. we don't have to attack that's something that killed me in 2016 where people like you know if you're a friend of mine and you vote for trump you're no longer my friend or vice versa if you vote for hillary you're no longer my friend like really yeah yeah. like yeah. seriously like it's we probably weren't friends in the first place you know <laughs> but that's right but that's exactly right like we lost those conversations like when did we stop talking about these interesting things and i don't know when it was and but you know sometimes people are like oh i don't want to get anybody riled up oh yeah get your friend riled up yeah yeah, have a have, have a healthy it. discussion. Yeah, have a, have a healthy discussion. That's what you're supposed to do in a Republican Democrat or whatever we call That's ourselves exactly nowadays. Right. That's exactly right. We're supposed to talk about these things. We're supposed to debate these things. You know, that's how we move forward in our conversations. Yeah, but Trump, I mean, he definitely destroyed people in those debates, right? I remember, I remember like um, Jeb Jeb Bush, like one of the favorites, right? And of course, like Trump, like destroyed him on something, right? And Jeb Bush just like ignored it, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he should like went back and attack, right? And so he didn't attack, and people, oh, Jeb Bush is a weak, weak mm-hmm. guy, right? He can't be president, right? And then he like he went like twelve percent to like the one point two percent the next day, right? It was crazy because he was a front runner. Yeah, yeah and like he had right? all the policy experience, like everything, right? Yeah. And he just like he just backed down, you know? Yeah. Okay, like I'm not here to argue with Mr. Trump, Mr. Policy. I'm like, dude, you're a fucking weak punk, right? 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 No, I, 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 I think you know, I think one of the things about Trump is you know he just brought this different obviously you brought a different sort of you know i don't know like i'm trump you're not yeah, i do what I, I do what i want like even now like i can declassify documents just by thinking it right right, right. yeah <laughs> like really dude like come on now i decided um but you know it it it, it just lowered the you know, it goes back to it. You know, when when did the conversation stop, right? Yeah. And you know, unfortunately, for like for Jeb Bush, nobody knew what was coming from Trump, right? I mean, no. I think everybody was like, okay, no, it's like he had no, no filter. Whatever he thought, he thought, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, you know, but Jeb Bush, whether you like him or not, he was a qualified individual. Yeah, damn, damn, damn qualified. Yeah. Of course, a lot of people were like, you know, do we really want to know the Bush of Clinton office, right? This is like a, a monarch dynasty, right? It's, right, right, right. One thing with Trump that he proved for good or bad. In America, it's great because anyone can get elected president. In America, it's bad because anyone can get elected president. 
I agree. <laughs> you, you just gotta be, I think you just gotta be 35 years old. Right. Like people are saying, how can Trump run? There's nothing kind of choose about, you know, all you lost saying if you have felony convictions or what the case it be, it's like you gotta be 35. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. No more, no less. I think maybe, you know, after this next run or at some point, you know, maybe, maybe like looked at it oh yeah definitely it has to be like 70 or below i think you know you know well and you know like when we look at like folks in the senate that are you know, 90 like the diane feinstein for california yeah. like no one's heard of supposed no one's heard of speaking like in two years he's in a wheelchair you know yeah yeah miss mcconnell from kentucky like like in the past i, I i've always been my thing term list is the voters right mm -hmm. but then again like you're in like if you're a, a district a state of kentucky and mr connell's serving your interest doesn't matter if he does a certain interest versus the country or you know maybe he does maybe he doesn't or any state you're in right you're voting for the, that state that representative that that district's best interests yeah yeah they really don't vote for like you know like if you go to vote for a uh, house representative who represents Edmund you're not thinking mm, I wonder what the I, I wonder what the the person that lives in you know Charlotte North Carolina will think about a decision yeah yeah it's not in your thought process you know it's, it's I go back and forth like on term limits. I I don't know. You know, I but I think there needs to be more control over like the side hustles that all our folks have. Like Yeah, it's kind of like you usually word again, it's kind of icky that someone's making pay. Like I think they paid two hundred thousand dollars a year or something like that, whatever the number is. And four years later they're like like twenty five million dollars or something like that, you know. Like yeah. um, man, what's her name? The Pelosi, like her husband is a better stock picker than um Damn, what's that guy's name? The one from Omaha, Nebraska. Oh, um, <sighs> man, I can't think of his name. The company or oh, oh the guy, oh, the guy. Um, yeah. Oh shoot, I totally know. Yeah, like about. he his, his yeah, record yeah, is yeah, better yeah, than yeah. him, right? Like, come on now, that's impossible. Well, and you know, I mean, we see so many people in the Senate and the House that just have like a wildly successful stock pick, right? Yeah. So I, I I would be totally in favor of of folks not being able to trade in the stock market yeah. while they're serving, you know, yeah. and because it is a public service job, yeah. you know that. And then how do you do like serve one term and you get retirement for the rest of your life? Yeah, that's kind of, and I think it's, I think in the house is two terms though, isn't it? Uh, maybe so. Yeah. Maybe it's two terms. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah still, that's cushy. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> or maybe it's a minimum four years or something. Or, or then, like, you know, you, you get paid, like, what's they, let's say they get paid $5,000 a year. I know, I don't know what it is. But then they spend, like, millions and millions of dollars to get elected. Like, the yeah. math doesn't work out right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, you know, I, I, I'm totally in favor of some campaign finance um, oversight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, where's all this money coming from? And, you yeah. know, maybe we don't need to spend, you know, millions and millions and millions of yeah. dollars for your seed so <clears throat> regardless of party or philosophy any kind of thing who would be your dream ticket Ooh. for president or vice president like oh. if they announce we got i mean they could be republican democrat whatever the case would be left far left far whatever the case be if they say you know what we're gonna buck the trend we're gonna run as president or vice president you're like okay i'm like i'm volunteering for you i'm, I'm, I'm on board oh my goodness oh i really like gavin newsom right now mm -hmm. like i like him a lot who would it be vice president or president? Who would be the other one? I don't know who the other one would be. Um, you know, I would say young Joe Biden, because I think he's done a great job, but for you know, but I think he's um I think Gavin Newsom is who I'd get behind. Gavin Newsom and and uh a woman for sure. <laughs> I just can't think of which one. Um I don't know. I don't know. Um Maybe Michelle Obama. I mean, those are kind of easy picks for a just sitting here. Yeah, that would be my dream ticket. Right so, this second. So back to 2016, you know, every everyone presumed like there's no way Trump could win, Hillary's gonna win. And they came out, I I can make this up like stat show, like no, a lot of women actually voted for Trump versus Hillary because like everyone was like, it's like a lot of females like, no, we want a female president, but not Hillary, right? Yeah, yeah. And then it kind of bit people in the, in the butt, so to speak, because then Trump put three judges on there. Overturn Roe versus Wade is like you know if you were just voted for Hillary, nothing would happen, right? But like it, like it was just such an anti-Hillary thing going on at the time, right? Yeah, there was, there was. I, I, I you know, I know people that didn't vote for Hillary because you know they didn't like the sound of her voice. I'm like, mm, all right, yeah. That's kind right. of odd reason. I mean, but yeah, okay, right, okay. But it's um, yeah, it was tough. And you know, I mean, there's so much. There, I mean, I mean, talking about how about somebody being qualified. She was way qualified. 
fine. Don't forget with me that old question. Um, I mean, Senator, former president's wife, um, Secretary, Secretary of State. State right? I like, yeah. She was really now. If you, now, if you read like the the tabloids, the books and stuff, you might uh, you know ruffle a few feathers, you know, and destroyed a few careers. Maybe you know some people say she had people killed, you know, like and all the yeah, controversy yeah. back to white white water and all that kind of stuff, you know. That's like Benghazi. So she definitely had a lot of baggage, right? But yeah, about qual qualified. Yeah, she's probably more qualified than anyone who's ran in the history of of, of the stuff. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. It's, you know, it's so hard. And it, and not just Hillary, but like anybody, there's just so much, you know, negative spin on so many things. And I think there's so many people that just rely on, on what they're, what they read or what their friend says or whatever that, yeah. And for me, I think that's my own self-interest. How entertaining would it have been to have Hillary Clinton president and William Clinton first man? That would have been off the chain. Like, I think I mean, all the trouble we got is the president. <laughs> you're like, hey, I'm not president, but I can do what I want. Like, you know, it, I'm not saying we do this, you know, interns, I can do what I want to. I bring all these people to come in, you know, right? You know, yeah. I'm just the first man. Like, that'd have been wild, right? I think it would have been cool. I mean, it, it, everything else aside, I think that would have been cool. And of course, you had have some people who say, you know, I know Hillary's the president, but Bill's really running the show, right? You would have people still saying that, of oh, course, yeah, you yeah. know. Oh, you for sure would have had people saying that, right? Because I can say in that press conference, Hillary said, like, President Hillary Clinton says, this is the policy of some dumbass, like, did you check with Bill on that? Right? That, oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy would have been dead the next day. Yeah, yeah. You, will, and you know what's so, so, so sad, I guess, is, you know, we still have that, right? There's mm -hmm. still this female, male, you know, the, it's kind of like, you know, like leadership, right? Like, mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in the command and control style of leadership. Like my dad was a manager at this, you know, manufacturing yeah. firm and, and you led by, you know, a firm, mm. a firm, you know, stand on everything. Um, but I think that's still. Yeah. Know, I mean, you see comedy skits all the time on Saturday Night Live, different places like, you know, people are talking, this lady was like, this, she's talking, we should do this, this, nah, that's, that's crazy. Not even two seconds later, some dude, we should do this. Great idea. <laughs> I literally just said that. No, you didn't. You said this over here. Yeah. Oh, you know, um, so obviously, you know, I've been in the, the working world for decades. Um, and so what I got really good at saying is, um, thank you, Bob, for highlighting my point. Or <laughs> because I cannot tell you the number of times where I, I've said something and it's like, hey, whatever. And then somebody else will say something. And everybody's like, oh, that's the smartest thing I've ever heard. And so what keeps you from like just getting a knife and slashing the throat, you know, like, ah. It's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's weird, but it's, um, it took a long time though, to like even get to a point in those meetings where I could say that, you know, I spent a lot of time like, oh, okay. I guess I didn't present it well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe yeah. I don't, maybe I don't communicate properly. Exactly. Like, okay. Man. But I did say exact, he did say exact word for word what I said, you know, yeah. maybe it's my tone or voice or inflection or, you know. Maybe I didn't stand up, you know, who knows? I know. Well, and no, and I went through the phase of I just said that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't that no. doesn't land well. It probably makes it worse. It makes it worse. So I found Oh, that. so you trying to take credit for this person did? <laughs> so I just found the thank you for highlighting what I just said. You know, but just said very softly and mm -hmm. nicely and and that was that was the most effective way of addressing it. But uh, Yeah. So what's your take? Um where's so Washington is like, well, I think it's called, Washington is a, um, is it called Blue? It's Blue State, right? Yeah. Has Washington, you live here all your life, right? I have, yeah. Has Washington always been a Blue State? Has it always been, has it ever been red? Like, for example, like Texas, people, it was like Texas conservative. People don't realize, like, for the longest time, Texas was a Democratic state. And then 1980, it became Republican. Then the Democrats took back over. Um, Ann Richards was governor for a couple of times. And then when... George Bush, he upset her in like 94, and they've been conservative since 94. So Texas only really been conservative, Republican since 94, but people think it's like since the 1800s, not right. So I wonder, has like Washington changed hands back and forth? It's been pretty much blue the whole time. You know, I want to say that it's been blue as far as I know, although I think everywhere went red in with the Reagan election. Yeah. I yeah. think pretty much, you know. That's true, yeah. Um, but, you know, my parents were very conservative and and you know when I turned 18 I too I'm like I'm I'm you know I'm what my parents were or are 
And, um, but I think looking back, you know, I think Washington always leaned blue. Mm -hmm. uh, like that, that's my yeah. lived experience. It's yeah. a pretty liberal. And, and with that, like, of course, like Seattle down Olympia, that quarter is like very liberal, but like, if you go to Eastern Washington, other places, like it's not so liberal, right? No, huh? very different. Yeah. Very and, and of course, people I realize, you know, like, I'd like to say, if you're a Republican in Washington, you might be a liberal in Texas, right? Because, Possibly, right? because like, you know, different policies are different, right? You know, and then if you're like a liberal in Texas, like you come here, like, no, you're not a liberal at all, right? You might, you might, <laughs> you might be a moderate Republican, but you're definitely right, not liberal, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, there's definitely a range. There's definitely a range. So, yeah. And so you're, you're living in like Edmond area during all your life or? Yep, yep, yep. I, you know, I, uh, I always thought I would move far away and mm -hmm. I didn't. I, I, I literally live within, well, I live on the other side of the water from Edmonds, mm. but if I were in Edmonds, I would literally be within two miles of the hospital I was born at. Oh, wow. And I'm like, I didn't go far. I thought I would. Yeah. But... Can you talk about the Edmond Bowl? I've been there a couple of times. Edmond mm -hmm. Bowl is like, this so, this is a nice place. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's one of my favorite places in the world. It's, um, and you know, having grown up in the area, I've just watched it go from like this sleepy little cute, mm -hmm. you know, waterside town to... It has fabulous restaurants. Mm -hmm. Like it is worth the drive to Edmonds to go to yeah. the restaurants they have there now. now. And they've got fun little bars and and town and shop and get, you know, you can get midday cocktails, which is always fun. Oh yeah. You know? Day drink is the best. <laughs> Day drink is super fun. Day drink is the best. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> and so Edmonds actually has like a war famous resident, don't they? Uh Rick Steves. Mm -hmm. I, I literally recently learned there, right? Like, how random is that? Like, this guy who's war famous, travels all over the world, yeah. lives in all the places at Edmond, Washington, right? Of all the places. Yeah, yep. And you know what's funny is um, I was at the and Rick Steves was at the table next to me. Mm. And I've never run into Rick yeah. Steves, ever. So, you like, you do live here. Yeah, I'm like, oh, that's Rick Steves. It would be hard for me not to, I mean, I'm not a photograph guy, autograph guy. It would be hard for me not to say, like, something. Because I watch all his shows, other stuff. Like, I'm, I'm a big fan of his, right? Yeah. It would be hard. I would, like, I would probably like this to be staring at him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was funny because I think I was just too into my my glass of wine and my pizza because I was really hungry. <laughs> but, it, um, and I didn't even notice him at first mm -hmm. until people started going over and taking pictures. But yeah, and I'm like, oh. that's because kind of, oh, I mean, I, I mean, he has to be used to it, you know, he's a public figure, right? Yeah, yeah. And he was people super nice. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. taking pictures and stuff. Yeah. And he, I, he, he took a picture with everyone that yeah. asked. Yeah. So, and now that I think about it, I didn't even capture a picture of him at all. I just watched. But, yeah, it was kind of cool. So, would you be a political junkie? You think you ever run for office yourself? Um, no, no. But if I lived my life again, mm. or if I could go back, back, back yeah. It, right. Um, but yeah, I don't want to now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, like wipe yourself through all that mess, right? Yeah. The final, the skeletal bones in your closet. Like Tammy skipped school in the seventh grade. <laughs> She'll make a horrible whatever you know, right. or she missed a payment, or whatever the case would be, or even worse. When her kid was eighth grade, you know, Tammy didn't do whatever, you know, she this is ridiculous. Terrible. Like, yeah. yeah, why, why run, why put yourself through that? Yeah. Unless your plans to make, become a millionaire off the stock tips, you know? <laughs> well, and I would want to run because like, I really want to, you know, do good yeah. and, and, you know, help bring change. And, and right now I feel like I'm just doing the best with my time, with my yeah. skill set right now, you know? So I've picked out this little thing that I'm going to work on, which is, you know, middle income, affordable mm -hmm. housing. That's what I'm going to work on. And, and I'm going to do it for a while. And I, I would want to run if I like, house arrest for a reason, right? You have to think when you, when you get this brief, like, oh, shit, there's really all aliens out there, right? Like they tell you the real deal, right? This is why you can't do that, you know, or like, we're actually you know, like some kind of puppet regime, right? Other con uh, conspiracy stuff. Yeah, you get the real dirt yeah. in there. Yeah. Show me what we don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if I'd want to know all of it for real. I think I'd rather just speculate. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna sit in that. I'm gonna sit in that space with that stuff. So back to housing. Um, how does Seattle become a real estate tech hub, so to speak? Like Redfin's here. I don't know off the top. I had like four or five people try, trying to do tech startups, real estate tech startups. How did Seattle become like a real estate tech hub, so to speak? I don't know. I really don't know. I wish I did. Um. I, you know, when Redfin came about and Zillow started in Seattle too, mm -hmm. I think, right? Yeah. Um, 
I was a traditional, you know, agent working just at a regular firm. And, and when Redfin launched, you know, we traditional agents, we did not like Redfin. Like what? Are I've heard that a lot from like people like Redfin, like, you know, the word anti-Redfin, you know, they're, they're just, they're, they're like disrupting the industry. They're not disrupting, they're destroying the industry, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. We're hearing that. Well, and you know, they started, Redfin started, um, they started on the wrong foot with the industry, right? Because they, they, and they had to, they had to shift their model and they did a really great job of pivoting and, and creating a better model to work with the industry. But, you know, when they first launched their agents didn't go out in person. And so they would call like the listing agents to show houses and all the listing agents, we all got pissed about that. Like, yeah, come on, come on, go meet your clients. Um, so it was really easy to hate Redfin. And it was funny because when I did go to work for Redfin. Um, so you became a trader? Uh, yeah. And I had to go like to all my industry friends, you know, and by then I'd been licensed, you know, I'd been an agent for like 12 years or something. And I just had to go and I'm like, okay, everybody, I'm going to Redfin. <laughs> and, uh, and I loved Redfin. I had a fabulous time working for Redfin. So... What's it recently? A lot of big corporations are buying like hundreds of houses, right? Like, like, like not one here, one here, but like really like hundreds of houses in neighborhoods and they're in the plants they're renting out, right? Yep. I mean, that's to be detrimental to the American dream of buying a home, right? Yep. They should stop it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They should knock it off. It's not cool. Is, is there any way, is there any way that can be stopped or is this? Well, you know, yeah, I think so. I don't have the answers to that one, but you know, I would, um, boy, you know, I don't know what it would be, but it would be more rules. So I'm guessing the corporations like are like basically doing corp cash offers, right? Oh yeah. And I have to, I have to imagine like how like you know like suppose I'm selling a house. How would I know it's even corporate because then right you know like yeah. how do you know? Well, on the contract it has the name of the seller or the buyer. Okay. Yeah. So you know, and I don't think they're trying to be necessarily sneaky about it. Yeah. I think they're just saying, you know, corporation, big you know, boy. Yeah. You know, if, if your house will say your house worth $300,000. All offers like 275, 250, 280. And this corporation comes with a $400,000 offer. But like, you know, once again, you know, everyone has like, wants to be a good person, but that's a lot of money to turn down. Right. That's Especially when you determine you're going to buy no matter what, sell no matter what, move somewhere else. Right. Like, yeah. You gotta do a lot more with your life and a lot more for your family at four hundred thousand versus two hundred thousand dollars, you know. Yeah. And you know, we couldn't ask that of anybody, mm -hmm. right? I mean, who I, you know, again, you can't ask sellers to donate no. their proceeds no. to, to a buyer just to do the right thing. Right? Yeah, I mean, this isn't a comedy society, right? Yeah, it doesn't that's not gonna work. But I think there's you know, I think there could be different rules put in place to prevent the big corporations from owning more than, you know, I don't know. Or maybe some rule, it's hard to leave, like some rule, like in like a one neighborhood, you can't have more like 5% of your homes owned by one person, you know? Yeah. Then with that, you know, what if you got like an individual landlord has like 10% of the homes in the neighborhood, right? Just because it's, you know. Yeah. I mean, they could be grandfathered in, you know, yeah. the ones that already own it. But yeah, I think, you know, it's kind of like it goes back to talking to your neighbors and knowing your neighbors and, and uh, like how important it is for communities to be a community yeah. right it's so different you know my i don't know so next talk about the concept of everyone being either being or having a lifeboat ah uh, okay so that's, see, see i did my research thank you <laughs> so i was uh it was like i don't know a couple months into the pandemic like 2020 and like everybody i was baking bread and gardening and um, I would garden with my headphones on and listen to podcasts. And I was listening to the Sam Harris podcast. And he was, he uh, was with Will McCaskill, who is just a philosopher. And Sam Harris is just ridiculously smart and also a philosopher and some other thing too. But so what they were saying is basically, you know, we don't, what we have is a lifeboat problem, right? We don't have enough lifeboats for everybody. And that really struck me because I'd been wrestling with like feeling crappy about like what we were doing as a real estate industry in, in, in helping or in contributing to the affordable housing situation. So when I started thinking about it, I was like, you know, I, th I think we get a little bit in our thoughts on giving, right? And I think we thoughts on giving where it's like, okay, I'm going to give a hundred dollars. So I want my hundred dollars to go 
I'm going to give it to paws, but I only want my hundred dollars to feed animals. I don't want my hundred dollars used to raise more money where really that hundred dollars could be put to better use by spending, you know, 50 on feeding puppies and another 50 on raising an extra $500, right? But we don't think about it like that, right? We've got, we've got these weird barriers to giving. So, and the other thing is just because you're giving, it doesn't mean you have to be a martyr, right? So the, it, and it was super visual for me. Like I'm in a lifeboat. I can be in a really nice lifeboat, like maybe with Netflix and an open bar. And there's room for like 15 people. I could squish 30 on, but I don't have to. I can still do good by bringing an extra few on. And we can still have this comfy lifeboat. Mm -hmm. And maybe that guy over there, he wants to put 30 on. And that's cool. And maybe they don't want to put anybody else on theirs. And that's cool too. But we have to acknowledge, right, that some people have a better boat. Mm -hmm. And we can all probably do a little bit more. Now, is the risk with that to push back a little bit? Is the risk with that, you know, you have a boat for like 20 people. You got 20 people, you give them people, you you give them person, man, I can fit more and more. But then before you know, you have 30 people, the boat capsizes and then everything is destroyed. You know, we were just, if you were just knowing your limits, yep. you yeah, know, yeah. what's yeah. that, what's that saying? Like take care of yourself first because empty vessel can't take care of other people or something like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think you do have to know your limits and, and, you know, I've spent so much time thinking about this be, because like, how much do I give? Like, just because I say I'm going to address this issue, does that mean I have to like sell my house and live in a shitty house or like yeah yeah <laughs> if if you're like worse off if you end up being worse off the previous time how about that kind of defeats the purpose right yeah it does and so it's kind of like what i'm trying to, to prove is like we can still have agents that make a great living and are doing good right yeah. because they're gonna they're gonna keep their netflix and you know wine or whatever it is right you don't have to give up everything it, it, should, it, it should be a time when you like you stop helping like suppose like i make this up like there's like tom tom jones right and you always give and give and give him and like you know but he never improves right is there a time where you say okay I, i've given my limit right this guy's not improving this person not improving it's time for me to cut ties or you just like keep on giving until something changes uh, you know that's tough um that's really tough um you know i think i think when we give there so for example like when we say we'll cover closing costs we do it on the honor method if you say you need the help we're going to help you but that means that somebody that doesn't need the help is going to get the money right yeah. and that's okay that's okay because I, what i really want to do is make it an easy experience for everybody else that actually needs it now if that person were to come back probably wouldn't do it again yeah. right because that's not cool but like in the general giving, I don't know. That's, I would say probably I'm not going to continue Okay. if there's no benefit yeah. to either party. And if my giving isn't helping, then maybe I'll give over there and that'll yeah. help. So if I were kind of on your website, you give 80% of your profits away? Yeah. Like, how's yeah. that work? Like, most well, people are like, 80% of your profits, how, how, how kind of, what kind of, how are you going to stay in business? What's going on? Like, like, are you a nonprofit? What are you doing over there? Right. It's hard. Well, and it's up to 80%. It's, it, it's, it, it lands right about, you know, it, it varies, but it, it lands right around 70%. But sometimes, you know, sometimes we're giving away 100% of the commission we make on something. And so the way it works is we work with people that don't need assistance. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to use, I'm just going to use really easy numbers. So, you know, if we make $10,000 in commission, we're going to use, you know, 2000 of that and pay the agent. And then we're going to use 8,000 of that. And we're going to put it into a fund to give back to buyers that need it. So does the amount of money you give back affect the commission you give to the salespeople? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they make what they make. Okay. Um, and part of that is, it's important that we, it's important that people understand that people can still make an excellent living and a comfortable living and drive a fancy car or whatever else they want to do with their great money, right? And do good, right? Yeah. You know, they don't have to be martyrs. You know, they're, all of our agents can make, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year range. And that's a lot of money, yeah. right? I don't see anybody making a million dollars a year, yeah. which they could do out in the traditional world, right? We're not really set up for that. So why is it doing good so important to you and your company? 
Oh boy. Um, I just feel like it's the right thing to do. You know, I have been so incredibly fortunate in my career and my life and, and I've worked really hard, but I've also been really lucky. And I know a lot of people have worked really hard, but didn't get as lucky. And, you know, I didn't do anything extra special or, or different. You know, I happen to be in a great industry. You know, this could have not been this way, right? Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, you know. It, That's in your DNA, so to speak. I think so. Yeah, it feels it feels like the right thing to do. And uh, So, after Redfin, you work for a company called, I think it's called Fly Home. Uh-huh. So what, what, what is Fly Homes? Is it like another Redfin type of company or is it like something totally different? Ish, um, kind of totally different. Um, but Fly Homes came out, it came on the scene, I think in 2015, 2016. And um, it, they started, uh, I'm pretty sure they started, the, the two co-founders um, went to graduate school together and I think Fly Homes was their, their project. Um, and what they did is instead, so at the time Redfin offered a rebate and so Fly Homes, and this is how they got their name, is they offered a rebate in the form of miles. Like Air, they don't do this anymore. This is way, way old. Um, but I remember I was working for Redfin at the time and I was here in Seattle and I came across Fly Homes and I was like, what is this crazy company doing? You know, but they would offer dollar for dollar. So if you bought an $800,000 house, they give you 800,000 air miles. And, and I was like, can you imagine what you can do with 800,000 air miles? Like, I'm going to fly first class to Dubai and drink cocktails and sip champagne, you know, for 15 hours. Probably a bad idea like that, but, you know, and um, that actually didn't last very long, but they 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 shifted into um, offering cash, being a cash offer organization. So if they helped people make cash offers that couldn't otherwise make cash offers. So they would basically kind of float the money. I'm, I'm really simplifying what they did, but it was a super hot market. <clears throat> cash was king. They came up with a product that offered, you know, regular home buyers the ability to make a cash offer. So this is like a multi-layer question, right? Like how do your time at Redfin and Fly Homes get you ready to be an entrepreneur? And what made you decide to become an entrepreneur? Um, so my dad was always an entrepreneur. So my dad, um, my dad and my, my parents, you know, had companies while I was growing up. So, you know, they were, they were almost always self-employed. Uh, my time at Redfin and Fly Homes, uh, you know, I had a great time in both organizations and learned so much and, and, but, you know, they're profit driven, you know, it's about profit. It's about market share. And then again, watching the house prices increase watching more and more people price out of homes, but watching our profits and our market share increase, it was like, eh. And so I thought, you know, is this what I want to spend my time doing? Like, do I, not really. Like, I'd rather spend my time kind of spreading this out a little bit. Like, sure, it's always fun to make more money, but at what expense? Like, I'm already having a comfortable life. And then you're just in this weird gravy land where you're like, okay, Sorry, you guys can't buy a house anymore because they're too expensive, but, you know, <laughs> so that was it. I was like, I don't want to spend my time figuring out how to maximize, prop, maximize profits. And, and when I started my organization, I spent a long time trying to figure out if I wanted to seek funding or not. And ultimately, I opted not to. And I think it's actually one of the beautiful parts of our organization is we do not now and we never will answer to shareholders or investors, which means... <coughs> We don't have to have record profits every year. And we won't because if we're making that much extra money, we're going to spread it out to our employees. People are going to make more. So are you, uh, I think it's called a, um, uh, man, uh, I think it's called Social B Corporation. Yeah. No, we're not. We're okay. actually just a regular old corporation. But I would say that we are a double bottom line organization mm -hmm. in that we look at we look at, you know, we are for profit, mm -hmm. like we do actually intend to make money. Um, but for the double bottom line, we're looking at, you know, what is our profit and how much do, good are we doing? Like there's two yeah. metrics that we're- So how come on. you didn't go with the, what was it called? Like It's um, B it's a corporation B. Yeah, how come you yeah. decide not to go that route? Uh, I didn't know about it. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good reason. And, yeah, I didn't know about it, you know? 
And I didn't know exactly what I was going to do mm-hmm. when, when I formed my organization. And I set up my organization, I think in 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was even before I left Fly Homes. You know, I knew I was going to do something different. Mm-hmm. I just wasn't sure exactly what it looked like. And it took a while for it to actually take shape. And of all your transactions, real estate items, or whatever you want to call it, happen in Seattle, or like you have transactions like different across the United States? No, we're only in Washington right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also licensed in Oregon. Um, but we're not doing anything in Oregon right now. Any plan to expand the empire, so to speak, anytime soon? You know, we will expand the empire as the need arises and okay. our ability to do so arises. Okay. Yeah, it's. Um, I would love to. I mean, I think it's. I think it's a great business model. Um, it's not going to appeal to everybody, and that's okay. You know, we don't all have to love everybody. That's all right. What's up? you realize now when you first started? You didn't realize that this certain aspects would be that tough. Oh boy, you know, and you can't say everything. You have to say something specific. <laughs> um, um, I think one of the challenges is um, recognizing that I'm not good at everything. Num- number one, I already knew I wasn't good at everything, but I also don't want to burden people, mm-hmm. right? And so I was slow to tap into my network mm-hmm. for help in different things. Um, and I think one of the other challenges is um, just, you know, realizing that there's just some things that are out of your control. Like, like I don't know what to do here. Like this, this thing, I have no idea what to do. I don't know who to call, you know, and th- I think that's the hardest thing about being an entrepreneur is number one recognizing that it's okay to reach out to people that you're not necessarily burdening your sphere by saying, Hey, I've got this problem. Do you have any ideas on a solution? Or do you know someone I should talk to? Um, and then just the, you know, I gotta say, I, I lost more nights sleep as an entrepreneur than I ever had before, but worried about people that have like hitched their wagon to me, mm-hmm. right? Like, gosh, I hope this works out. <laughs> yeah. People don't realize that like, not only like entrepreneurs are just hiring someone about it's a particular it was like you're not only hiring jason you're hiring jason family right yeah yeah And because the decisions you make good or bad affects that family because like you make a bad decision you might lose a company and that person has no job right or yeah. you know and people don't let don't take into consideration that much i think yeah it, and that you know and, and the people part is is i don't know it's just so weighty like it's so weighty like i just just don't want to do wrong by opted to join me so how do you how you uh, like balance that right you know you have to make a decision like how do you balance taking care of your employees versus taking a company right because you don't take care of the company there's no job to pay them you don't take care of employees there's no company you know so how, i mean that's gonna be a tough balance right yeah it is a tough balance um and i think that i think it's a tough balance whether you're an entrepreneur or not right? yeah just, we just work a sales manager somewhere yeah, yeah just or mid, mid-level manager or mcdonald's manager yeah right, right i'm I mean, if it's full, right? I mean, and I think, I think that's where it gets really hard sometimes. Like when you're in an organization that is not yours, you are pulled in two different directions, right? Because you might have upper management saying, you know, we've got, you know, these metrics, you know, mm-hmm. metrics, 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 and and um, and then you've got these people, right? Yeah. That you need to. And you know, like Bob, you know, his father just died. You know, he can't be really focused, or you know. It's all in on the month of June, right? Because uh, whatever company, but in June, this new hire, you, he knows that every June his family goes on a family vacation, the whole family for a week in June, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And those are the things that I think are so important, right? And it's kind of like the work-life balance thing we were talking about earlier. Like it, it's different for yeah. all of us, right? Yeah. I, number one, thinking of it as balance, you know, you're going to, you're going to drive yourself crazy. Oh yeah. Um, I have to work eight hours. I have to get, take a break for three hours. You know, this is yeah. ridiculous. It's just, you know, yeah, but I think people need to own that themselves. Like, and I think, I think good leadership allows them to do that. Um, But yeah, I think, I think it's just a challenge. And I think it always has been in any role that works with other people that influences other people in any way. Yeah. So what what does your company actually do? What do we actually do? So. And and how do you say the company name? Zequity. Okay. Like what it sounds like a Z, but it's an X. And why is the X small versus big? Is that, is, it has to be by design, right? Yeah, it's by design. Um, so have you heard of the author Bell Hooks? I think so, yeah. Okay, so Bell Hooks is this amazing author, or was this amazing author, and 
she did not capitalize her first and last name just as kind of a humility thing mm -hmm. and i was so just moved by by her that i okay I went with a lower and the name is south does it i'm guessing it has some kind of meaning right is this not a random name right yeah no it's not random it um so <laughs> naming the company is really hard work um, and I actually had a, a can you say it again? People don't realize how hard that shit is, right? <laughs> Naming a company is really hard work. It's uh, you have to have like the Facebook, the com, the CO. You, you, you got to make sure it means something like bad in a, another language. Yeah, it's so hard. But, but we came across it because equity, right? So we started with yeah. equity because we're trying to equalize to some degree, right? The opportunity to own a home. Um, X because it's cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. also x being like the multiplier like um, we're going to be the multiplier and getting people from you know thinking about owning a home mm -hmm. to owning a home so there was just all of that is what went into it now i will say choosing a name that starts with x is confusing because nobody knows how to pronounce the name that starts with x so like in my email sig signature i've got it in parentheses <laughs> <laughs> yeah i saw that yeah yeah, yeah right yeah so equity um um uh, but at some point you just have to choose you're like okay that looks good <laughs> let's go with that one but yeah you know we found the dot com and the dot org and 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 i think we had to pay a little extra for the dot com but there's nothing available out there i mean you just be making up some random nothing to get all of the yeah things i, I said this for my pocket my name come my company's at kevin's hr I told myself, I've never been the douchebag who needs my coming out stuff. So I've never do it right. But I looked through so many names, like names I like someone already had, you know, like on and on. I, I wasted too much time, right? Yeah. And I finally, this guy named Nick Hughes said, Jason, this name you're coming out yourself, right? You're yeah, spending yeah. too much time, right? It's a common, it's, you know, it's an easy name to say. It's not like it's like Paul Wallowitz or nothing like that, or like six E's and two B's, whatever. Just go with that, right? But yeah. now, right? It's okay. I guess I'll be that douchebag who needs to come out himself. <laughs> Yeah, it's well, and you know, I would have actually done that because it is. I, I mean, I think it's fine. Yeah, when you think about it, like you know, Mercedes Benz, Harley Davidson, all these name brand companies, Sean John, are named after the people started, right? You yeah. know, like. Yeah, and I think that would have been fine. And the the one reason that I avoided my name is I wanted to make sure that the focus was never on me. Yeah. Um, you know, going out and pushing to yeah. this public thing, um. And so that was the one, that was the one reason I, I didn't do that. Yeah. So how do you, like, how do you make money? What's the business model? Yeah. So the business model is commission. I mean, it's okay. just like a real estate. Fake commission. Okay. Yeah. We, we. And commission. does the commission change based on any criteria? So it's the same commission each time. Well, sellers in Washington choose their commission amount, right? Okay. They, they determine paid on a transaction to either the buyer's agent or the seller's agent. And that's how we earn money. So. Okay. You know, like any other for-profit real estate brokerage is we are in commission and that's where our profit comes from. Who would like your, say, your perfect customer? My perfect customer? Well, there would be two. You okay. know, there would be one that does not need any assistance, mm -hmm. right? That loves the mission we're on and yeah. wants to contribute to it. And then and there would be one that does need assistance. <laughs> <laughs> go home because of this customer, yeah. right? I mean, these okay. do balance each other out. So how do you like let people know what you're doing? Like you have a marketing campaign, social media, word of mouth. Like how do you get this word out about what you're doing? Yeah, well, gosh, that's a, that's also turned out to be really hard to do. Um, so we have LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Facebook. You know, we're trying to push content out um, weekly, which is also really challenging. I mean, man, there's a lot to do. But uh, but yeah, so we do Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. Have you found like one social media like that's really like performer for you versus other ones? Um, and of course, performer for you can mean totally different things, of course. Yeah, you know, I I would say LinkedIn actually, we get a lot of people reaching out through LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah, which I didn't expect it to be that way. Yeah. But it is. And, um, but yeah, people like it. And then they send somebody else and which is how it's supposed to work, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So how do you take care of yourself? How do I take care of myself? Um, ooh, well, I don't exercise enough. Um, and I don't meditate enough. Um, but a glass of wine equals like two minutes, all that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I do drink wine. Um, you know, I 
I do try to be mindful, right? Mm -hmm. Which is really hard and it because it doesn't come naturally to yeah. me. Um, if we were in my office right now, you would see all of these sticky notes all around <laughs> the computer screen with, and they're just mindfulness notes, mm -hmm. right? And, and I try to do that. And then as silly as it sounds, I try not to sit at my desk all day long mm -hmm. and I will sit at my desk. All yeah. Day I do my best. Like at least hopefully two or three times a day, just get up and walk around the block or something. Yeah, exactly. But it's hard to do, unfortunately. Right. It is hard to do. It is really hard to do. And so. So I try to do that. And then, you know, I do like, I'll set like an alarm on my phone and I call it my gratitude timer. Mm -hmm. You know, half the time I just shut it off and mm -hmm. I don't sit there. <laughs> really, you know, but I keep trying mm -hmm. um, and I keep trying. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I like to read a lot of self-help stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't always implement it, but I get a little bit something out of each thing. I add a new book. How many people are your team right now? There's four of us. Okay. Yeah, we're pretty small right now. And so obviously, you know, you do well, you're going to grow, whatever. Yeah. How, like, what do you look for in a, in a real estate agent or, or what do you want to call it right? Like, yeah. So, Tupac, what do you look for in them and how do they like, suppose you're going you to hire someone tomorrow, right? What would they need to do to like, like convince you? Uh, you know, they would have to align with our mission, mm -hmm. right? They, they would have to feel passionately about the social justice piece of what we're doing. Um, they don't have to be an experienced agent, but I will say that when new agents do come on board, they do have to work with an experienced agent as a mentor because at the end of the day, we are still real estate brokers and we need to deliver, you know, knock your socks off service. Is there such a thing as like a real estate intern where like somebody comes to you and say, hey, I haven't taken my license yet. I don't be a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. Can I like, in what do you call intern, low level job until I get my agent? license and then work for you full time does that even exist yeah yeah okay. it can and heck yeah i would totally do that you know okay. and i think you know i think the i think the cultural fit is more important mm. than the i'm already licensed thing right okay. license is easy to get we can get anybody okay. through that but um yeah i think just a, a good fit you know with the mission and the team i think yeah i think that's so valuable so in your years doing this What's the craziest or most observed house you sold or, or sold or bought? Of course, crazy and observed could be anything you define as that, right? Oh boy. Ooh, hmm. I have seen some crazy houses. Um, hmm. Boy, let me think, let me think. You know, I have seen, oddly enough, people do really crazy things with bathrooms and toilets. Mm -hmm. Like you'll find toilets and like, very odd places sometimes in a house you're like you get like you want to call and say you know what what what, what was going on here? yeah what's you know why is there a toilet in the corner of the living room like what, what? <laughs> that's weird. oh my goodness yeah there's just some crazy stuff um or like doors that you know you and typically it's like a remodel where somebody mm. didn't think of everything through all the way or 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 measure properly maybe um yeah, there's a, um, but, you know, I can't think of like any super, super crazy okay. thing. The worst thing that ever happened to me was I was touring a house by myself and it was a really big house and it, like really big. Um, and this was during the big um, crazy market downturn, Ooh. right? In the 2008-ish. And um, so I'm, I'm touring this house. It's empty. I think it was bank owned. Ooh. And I got downstairs and there's no power on. So I've got my little iPhone flashlight on. I round the corner and my brain is like not quite catching up to my eyes because there's a sleeping bag, there's a cooktop and there's a lit candle. And I couldn't get out of that freaking house fast. Yeah, I can imagine. Like, yeah. Holy shit. There's somebody in this house and I'm like two floors down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, after that, I thought twice about going into bank home homes mm -hmm. because you know, as a real estate agent, yeah. you're touring them all the time. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I thought twice after that. Like, okay, is the power on? I remember I saw this one house on, on what I remember was, this, it was so, so cool, right? And like, if they had like a speakeasy in the house, right? Like you had like, it was like the, the it was like a bookshelf that like, did the book thing and it go downstairs, like big fancy speakeasy, everything in it. I had a speakeasy game room, like, oh my God, it's so freaking cool. Oh yeah. I always like the houses too, like they had like wine cellars in them, right? Like, man, like, if you have a wine cellar in your house, you're, you're pretty well off, right? Right, right. 
I'll just go down the wine side. I pick out a one, a one hundred bottles of wine I have down there. You know, like, yeah, you're living pretty comfortable. I have a wine closet, mm. and I keep telling my my husband, like, you know, before we ever sell our house, I'm gonna paint it red mm. so that we can call it the wine cellar. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all you need is a closet yeah. painted red, right? Yeah, Probably. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and is a wine cellar of two bottles of wine, a thousand bottles of wine? It's up to you what a wine cellar is, yeah, right? Yeah, it's up to you, right? It's yeah. Gonna, in there it's gonna i mean as long as the wine is not strawberry booze farm or nothing like that right. you know it's like so <laughs> kind of you need to do some kind of you know level of wine those used to be good yeah 1985 i would have yeah. gone for that <laughs> oh yeah definitely yeah definitely um so who are your mentors hmm boy um you know i have i have a couple people in my personal life that that i i i seek their advice mm. um you know, my, my dad was an entrepreneur. So, so I love to chat with my dad. Um, and it's also funny to talk to my dad though, because, you know, he retired 25 years ago and, um, you know, he led a different sort of business. He led manufacturing organizations and, um, but he's super smart and he's just got some really great ideas that are so different from my own. Um, so I really love kind of going to my dad for some things, even though, we're very, very different. Yeah. <laughs> and who are you mentoring? You know, um, I have agents that I mentor, like the agents that people that want to get into real estate, um, people that are new in real estate. Um, I think so, you know, I have, I have random people that I somehow just end up connecting with and talking to them and most of them end up being like my kids age mm -hmm. um i'm just saying it's crazy like i i i don't say i meant I, I have so many kids like not kids like people 20 to 30s like coming for a bus i'm talking right now but it's really crazy like my own kids yeah no like, like right yeah like they're like get out of here you know what we're talking about but people their age all the time yeah. I, I yeah it's kind of crazy right like yeah i don't understand it yeah. I, I never will yeah and it, to be honest it's frustrating too right like i i can have you this and that no you can't <laughs> you know there was some random kid i meet somewhere like you talked to me on linkedin hey you know okay yeah 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 exactly exactly most of my kids are pretty good about seeking advice as needed and taking it mm -hmm. um but you know they're working their way through and yeah. figuring their own stuff out and you gotta be there for them right yeah yeah got a little soft pad for them to crash on if yeah. they're gonna do that but so this might be a tough question for you right. how does your company fail Oh boy. I think there's probably a thousand ways. Um, you know, I think the company fails if we're not able to get at least one person into a house every year. Okay. You know, if if, if even we can help one. That person. seems like a pretty reasonable goal, just one house a year. Yeah, it's a that's actually a pretty, pretty low bar. I would hope we would do better than that. Yeah, yeah. I would think yeah, your bar needs to be a little bit than that. Yeah, yeah. I, I I would hope. But you know, I I like to think in effect even one family's ability to buy a home that's success and if we aren't able to do that i think we fail nice um so you know different entrepreneurs do different things you know famously elon musk works 100 hours a week supposedly you know i have like one friend he works 20 or 30 days takes three days off in the middle of one three right yeah like the three days he completely cuts everything off right no phone no nothing he just like hibernates right ever and, and you know you have people people do different things you gotta do what's best for you what have you found works best for you? You know, uh, what works best for me is actually just extending some, the same grace I extend to other people mm -hmm. to myself and going away, you know, uh, like a couple of weeks ago, my husband and I took our sailboat up to the Salmon Islands mm -hmm. for 10 days. And I brought all this work with me and we got up there and our little tiny boat and we, you know, anchored in this Harbor. I didn't open my, my work at all. Mm -hmm. I, I had somebody, you know, handling clients and stuff. I think that's important though, right? I mean, for me, I, I have to set, and I don't have a set schedule. Like I work and then I don't work. You know, I feel like I kind of, for me, they just are smushed together, yeah. right? But I've done that for decades and that's fine and it works for me. But at the same time, I need to be able to step away mm -hmm. and have a team I can trust to, to you know, keep the lights on and, and not catch anything on fire while I'm gone. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's so valuable just to have a trusted team that allows you to go 
unexpectedly to the San Juans for 10 days. You know, I can't do it every month, obviously. But yeah. Well, one day you'll be able to do it every month. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. One day they come and just run by yourself. You'll you hire a CEO or the chief of staff and they'll just report to you. You know, ideally, I will step away from this organization and then it will be employee owned mm -hmm. and I'll just be a consultant to them. Yeah. So how do you people get paid? Is it like strictly commission? Is it a combination of commission note and salary? How's that work it's for you? It's a combination. You? Yeah. Okay. So they get, there's a combination of base salary. And, and then how do you decide that split, so to speak? You know, we're still working it out, honestly. Mm. Um, you know, we, I came up with the split based on what I thought would be um, a reasonable income mm. for somebody that has just started in the industry or midway and do you base or, income on like national average for let's say agents on based on a seattle like seattle. what are you based on seattle yeah okay. seattle that's a pretty high high rate yeah 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 for kind sure. of kind of jacked every hire somebody in seattle like i'm gonna base your salary on uh starkville mississippi yeah, you yeah, know yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's one way that we would fail. <laughs> yeah yeah it's um yeah but hey you can make a great salary and we can do good we can do both so yeah um so um, how, how often do you go on social media yourself? Well, I try not to go on Facebook because it's insidious and I lose. That's a good time. word for it, insidious and icky. Right. Um, but I do go on Facebook because I, I follow some sailboat pages. Mm. <laughs> and, and I like to they're traveling the world, right, in their sailboats because I think that looks like such a cool thing to do. Um, but like LinkedIn. Okay. I I check in with those probably and, daily. And how long have you been selling boats? Is something a skill you all you always say you learned you've been doing it for a while. No, so I started sailing like 20 years ago. And when I say started sailing, I took lessons for like a month. Mm -hmm. And and then I went out a few times in between. Yeah. He has sailed for a couple decades. And you own do you own the boat y'all have? Yeah, we do. Are those yeah. like pretty expensive? I think I, when I think I'm still about thinking like million dollar boats. You oh know. no, 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 no! This is like a Honda. Okay, like a, yeah, a Honda version. Honda. So you don't have the you don't have the chest over here. The Honda. No, we've got like a 1992 Honda Civic. Okay, <laughs> but you know how it came to be is so we moved to Kingston, mm. you know, which is a water community, and there's a marina there. And my husband, we knew that heading to have a boat, a sailboat. Mm. And we heard that the waiting list at the marina was years long. So we got our name on the waiting list. Yeah. And our name came up after like a year, year and a half for a slip at the mm -hmm. marina. And if you don't take your slip, you get booted to the back yeah. of the line. So we're like, okay, we'll take the slip mm -hmm. and then we'll get a boat in a few months. Mm -hmm. So like five minutes later, my husband's like, hey, I found the boat. I'm like, what? Of course that he did. not the time for a boat. Of course he did. Yeah. So um, so we you probably like it's such a great deal. We can't beat it. Uh, yes, I think that's exactly what he said. <laughs> and then he said, "Well, let's just go look at it, so we have an idea." Yeah, yeah. You know, again, we're sailing at home two days later, and, and he's probably selling the boat more than the actual boat owner is. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, so that's how we came to have a sailboat. <laughs> um, so is that true that when people buy boats is actually like a what's sort of like a money dump? You know, because you're spending so much money on upkeep and stuff like. Yes, it is true. My husband uh, and I, he says everything on our boat's broken. We just don't know what, what thing is broken right now. Mm -hmm. So, but we're getting more joy out of it than pain. So, so far, so good. But are, you, are you and your husband like expert swimmers? No. Uh -uh. Okay. I mean, we're, we both swim. So I'm guessing y'all have that life vest tight oh, every yeah. single time, right? Yeah, I am. I am absolutely. You've got to wear your, you've got to wear your, your flotation device. Right. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm all, it's always on and nobody gets to come sail with us without one. So have so you went out 10 day trip. Is that what's the longest trip y'all been on that one, that one right there. Yeah. I, I had never even, I see so you on the water 10 days. And so like, how do you plan to you know what food to bring? Like, you know, I mean, cause you like, Oh yeah. The rations you want to call it food <laughs> rations, drink rations, you know? Well, it was kind of funny because our plan was only to be gone for three days. And at the last minute, we both ended up with this window where it's going to be good for us to be gone for a little bit longer. So, and we were planning to leave the next day. So the next day I was like, okay, I'm going to pretend like I'm going camping. What would I make for camping? And then I made like a bunch of meals like that morning. And I was- The sailboats don't, don't, they don't have like stoves and stuff, right? Like, no yeah, they do. do yeah, they? Okay. Yeah. Well, they don't all, but this one, this one does. Okay. Does. And, um, 
but the fridge in our boat is like a cooler yeah it's not really a fridge and then it's a pain in the ass because everything is stacked like a cooler but you're like digging down on the counter um but we did great we had ham sandwiches for breakfast every morning Mm -hmm. which was not planned on but you know it turned out to be ham was on top of the cooler so every morning i'm like i don't want to dig down in the ice you want a ham sandwich Yeah. yeah so um but we did pull into we docked um at a couple different places so we you know we got mm. off the boat but we didn't eat out at all okay um, um so i'll make this up but is there such a thing like you know like uber eats when he brings food out to their boat or like <laughs> you run out of fuel and some random company brings fuels you up in the middle of the ocean or something like that it's the coast guard if you run out of fuel <laughs> yeah yeah that happens yeah that's not a good day <laughs> bring diesel and sandwiches <laughs> that's not a good day <laughs> Yeah, that's a bad day. So. Yeah, the Coast Guard is on your boat, in the area of your boat. Yeah, it's probably things are going wrong, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah something. Yeah, hopefully, I've never had to call the Coast Guard, but I haven't sailed too much, and mm-hmm. I hope I never have to call the Coast Guard. So you, you probably don't want to do this in your hottest ship or sailboat, but is the plan able like you know get like a, a, a northern San Diego, like something like do something like that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, my husband and I are are right now just kind of talking about like what do the next several years look mm-hmm. like for us like when you know we're at that age where we got to kind yeah. of think about when we want to retire how active we want to be and and right now we are definitely talking about getting a bigger boat and mm-hmm. and going on a big grand adventure any thoughts of like selling your house and just, and just going all in on the sailboat life so to speak yes yeah yes um i don't know how realistic that is mm-hmm. just yet but i'm going to keep in touch with you because yeah. if i do it i'm going to be like I am um no but there is like but you know that's all part of it right mm-hmm. like yeah like our house again is, I guess, and I don't know how do you your kids are mom dad grandparents are you kidding me like how are we going to visit you on a sailboat like what's a yard to play in like what's going on here like right. you know no you can't have a midlife crisis on us <laughs> right yeah no we do have grandkids so um we've got two grandkids they're nine and six and they're they're fabulous um but yeah that and you know and i think we get trapped in what we think we're supposed to do mm-hmm. and that's so hard to get out of but like i think that i'm supposed to offer this family home like yeah. we've got a place all of the kids home for yeah. christmas and but how often, they, how often they actually come for every holiday right right and so and like how many people like buy this big house i'm buy this five bedroom house would it be cheaper to buy a two-bedroom house mm-hmm. lower payment is just like pay for the hotel room if they do if they do come just that's right get them a nice hotel room and that's what we're looking at right now so like our kids we're, we're super lucky that they, they they dig hanging out with us so they do come but like it's really expensive mm-hmm. to own a big house to accommodate your kids the electric like, bills and upkeep they mentioned though i won't say time you y'all waste that people waste cleaning the big ass house but that's a like, lot like you had better things to do than dust some random, you know, whatever it is somewhere in a room no one goes to, you know? Yeah. Well, I was talking to a friend of mine recently and I said, you know, my housekeeping standards have gotten lower as we <laughs> yeah, age. Exactly I, right. I don't care, but I know what I hate doing is I hate squeegeeing in the shower. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I hate doing that. So I stopped. And now, you know, and I remember why you have to squeegee it because of hard water stains. Yeah. You gotta work really hard. I'm like, I think I should just buy new glass doors. Yeah. Like, be easier I sell it, and I'm probably gonna... yeah and probably cheap if you, if you, if you say your town's works like a hundred dollars an hour whatever the case may be right right like but yeah the, i mean that's where we're at right now look like and heck could we go on a big grand adventure and sell our house and like be crazy i, I remember like reading a story where like a, a retired married couple like sold everything and they and they like went all the world like different remember it was during covid they started the trip during covid and then they docked somewhere at the Australia and like had no idea what was going on. And, and talk about a, a oh freaking shock. Like, oh my God. Like, it could be almost like, it's almost the same. Like, you know, you, you're in your sailboat, you dock Australia and you, you find out aliens have taken over the world, right? Right. Like, well, COVID, what's this pandemic? What are you talking about? What do you mean I can't do this, you know? Can you imagine? Oh my God. When they didn't have masks with them. Oh, no, no definitely <laughs> not, right? Yeah, definitely not. In Australia, oh. it was like one of the places. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine. That'd be so, oh, that'd be so scary. And talk about doing what's the best for you. I have a niece, like she's getting ready to decide like a big life decision. I told her, now that you ask for advice, my advice to like make decisions what's best for you, right? Not on what you're, you think someone wants, someone feels, what your parents want or your best friend wants or, yeah. or do what's best for you. And only you, know, only you know what's best for you. What's best for you is going to end up being best for everyone else, right? I think that is the best advice you can give somebody. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 
it's because no one has your best interest except for you right yeah exactly yeah and we get trapped by all oh, that. Yeah. oh this person wants me to do this or i have to take care of this person or if i live close here do this you know like you know uh, like yeah 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 and that's hard and mm-hmm. the guilt and all oh, yeah, the most of the guilt you know oh this person did something from me in the past and I am not there for them or yeah, sometimes you just got to break tires right and do what's best for you. Absolutely. I totally agree. So is there um anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Uh, not that I can think of. Um, I t- could totally just sit here and talk all day, I think, but not that I can think of. Okay. So next, you want to talk about your company some, but go to more detail about how the company got started. What you focus on now? What your your big dream business for that company moving forward? So my big dream moving forward. So number one, I want to continue to do what we're doing, right? Which is help people get into homes by giving them a, you know, a, a push over the finish line. Um, moving forward. So I've also started a nonprofit organization, and I haven't talked about it much because we don't have our tax exempt status yet, and that's really hard to get. But we're working on it. But the idea with the nonprofit is. What I want to be able to do is, you know, on the front end, of course, help and assist people get into homes. But then I want to be able to, you know, maybe to be able to offer um, grants to help them remodel a bathroom or replace a garage door. Because a lot of first-time buyers, you know, they're they're putting all of their money into paying to live in their house, right? And and so maybe they're buying an older house or a house that needs fixing up. You know, if they are responsibly sustaining their home ownership, I would love to be able to offer them a path to build equity a little bit, right? Like here's, you know, not huge grants, but, you know, like maybe $5,000 grants to do, you know, a, a bathroom fix up or again, you know, just some stuff that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, and then the, the other thing that I do that I want to expand on is I'm trying to put first time home buyers, I'm trying to connect them to a seasoned homeowner, you know, as their mentor, because a lot of like first generation homeowners, they don't know that you got to put a hose bib on or Mm -hmm. clean the gutters, you know, they need somebody to guide them. So I'm trying to make sure there's this partnership. Yeah. I mean, here's the, I don't know, but I like. Some place like Texas, it freezes like 30 degrees. Like you need to know how to get the water, right? Yeah. So yeah. I was in Texas with my daughter last December, like a month, right? I had, I had like a deep freeze. Half the home was in April, like pipes broke. Cause, oh, yeah. Because right. no one knew like drip the water, right? Yeah. They had no clue, no concept. Yeah. And so I want to be able to have, you know, you know, the, the homeowner, the mentor is going to call the, the new homeowner and say, hey, you know, we got a freeze coming in. Mm-hmm. Maybe you didn't know this. You should do this. Or, you know, now is a good time to, you know, make sure your whatever is checked or, you know, just those things. Like my parents owned a house. Mm-hmm. I could call my dad and yeah. he would tell me what to do. Um, there's a lot of first time buy- home buyers that their parents didn't own a house. Mm-hmm. So I just want to be, you know, I want to be the organization that just keeps giving. Not like, hey, here's a, you know, seed packet because it's the spring and you should plant some tulips. But like, <laughs> hey, here's some... <laughs> Make sure you cut your grass once a week or something right, like right. that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I want to do something meaningful mm-hmm. with impact. And um, and that's that's where I see the future of the organization. Here's a question for you. Like, how does this work, right? I'm totally making this up. I'm sure it happens all the time. Close as a house, right? And we'll say, you know, maybe last year, or maybe 10 years before, but like sometime during the house, either someone like something bad happened, either it's like somebody died in the house, someone got killed in the house mass murder, whatever bad thing you want to think about, right? Suicide. Like when someone is looking at buying a house, does that stuff have to be told to them or they have to like, or they have to like do the research themselves and find that out? Yeah. they Well, and that's kind of a, so there's really specific disclosure laws in Washington and, and you do not have to disclose that somebody has died in the house. Mm-hmm. You do have to disclose any material defect. Mm-hmm. Um, I am a fan of over disclosing, mm-hmm. right? I, I just the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, I understand there's some sensitive things. Yeah. And what I've learned over the course of, of my career is the buyers that that's important to will ask. Yeah. And, and plus, one, it'd be one thing like, this is my opinion, like if someone like, if they're, if they're selling the house, if someone got killed or died in it, right, that's one thing, right? Maybe 10 years ago, maybe 
maybe not right. The person who died, his ghost is not in the house, right? Right. Like, if his ghost is in the house, yeah, that's a deal breaker. Yeah, that might have to be disclosed. Like, yeah, you know, if there's a ghost house, that's a deal breaker. Like, <laughs> if, if the outline on the floor where the body is, that, is that outline is so there, yeah, that's a deal breaker, you know? Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe as a closing gift, you can offer like a, a smudging or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like you know, like all the like horror comedy movies. You know, go we buy a house, get out. You know, right? <laughs> Yo, can you imagine the welcome basket for that house? You oh. put all the crazy. Oh, that'd be terrible. Yeah. Like funny and terrible all at the same time. And and back talk about your experience, like the like the candle house. I know you seen like the, the Gecko commercial with this the Gecko from the Gecko insurance and the dudes walking upstairs, and all the like mannequins up there. The dude like no, I'm no, 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 no. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It. I actually just sold a house recently where there were mannequins, mm -hmm. um, but they'd cut them in half. <laughs> and so like the bottom half, like they, they, they cleaned out like where the hips were and turned them into planters. It was really kind of funny, but it, you know, when you're walking up to a house and on the front porch is the top of a mannequin yeah. with his arms all splayed, you're like, uh, I wish somebody would have told me about this. Right. What is going on in there? <laughs> I know. I called the agent, the other, the listing agent. She's like, yeah. You know, the owner is an artist. I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's cool. Do you find like in your real estate career, like selling homes, buying homes, like be like at the times like you, where you're like, hey owner, like you're killing me right now. Like you're not doing a good job, you know, either like presenting the house or making, you know, like I'm sure you go into houses or and like the house like this crap dirty, you know, or like not presentable. Like, how do you like make convince the owner like, hey, you gotta put some work in too, it's not on me? Yeah. Um, you know, I think you or maybe like you say you want to sell a house, but do you really want to sell a house? Yeah. Well, and that's it too, right? Like this is going to affect your proceeds. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you want top dollar. This is how you get top dollar. Mm -hmm. You do this, 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 and this. Um, and if you can't do it, we'll do it for you. But you understand why we're doing it. Um, I have, you know, there's some sort of, I remember once I had to call a homeowner. I'm like, hey, you got to put the bongs away. The what away? Bongs. Like. Oh, Okay. I'm like, they're distracting for people looking at the house. Like maybe just put them in the closet or something. Under the bed or something. Right. You just, they should, you know, you do you. That's cool. But it's distracting. Um, or like, you know, sometimes people will have risque artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, okay, that's lovely. But maybe, maybe not why the house is for sale. I mean, it was some crazy, the walls painted some crazy colors. Maybe we need to repaint them from yellow, pink polka dots and, you know, zebra stripes to like something more, you know, like more common yeah yeah and we do for sellers is is we'll um we have a fix-up fund mm -hmm. so for people selling their house we'll come in and we'll actually cover the painting mm -hmm. and staging and all of those things because a lot of times sellers number one they don't want to do it mm -hmm. or they can't afford to do it or it's hard to do it right sometimes it's really emotional mm -hmm. selling a house yeah. and painting over the kids all the name. memories and stuff yeah, yeah. Is there a time when you have to tell a, buyer, a, a seller, like, hey, your house has been on the market for like, you know, X number of days, X number of months. We need to lower the price or we need to like take it off the market. I heard, always heard that like, if your house has the market too long, you should take it off and put it on there later on. Yeah. Well, you know, there's different, there's different ways of looking at it. There's a lot of different philosophies surrounding it. Um, the crazy thing about the Seattle market is it hasn't been an issue for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Um, last year, I think was a little challenging because we did start seeing prices affected because of the rising interest rates. Um, but, and those are, those are hard conversations to have, right? It's, um, and you know, when I, when I have those early conversations with sellers, it's so hard to make sure they don't get too, you know, focused on what could be right. Yeah. Like there's this range. Here's the range that we're probably looking at. There are surprises. You know, we don't we don't know what might be around the corner or that might come up on an inspection or that rising interest rates are going to affect pricing, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I've actually I've done both, right? I've 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 had the let's lower the price conversation, and I've had the you know sellers that are don't have a life need mm -hmm. reason to move. You know, maybe let's take it off, let things cool down, mm -hmm. and we'll come on again in the spring or whenever right and so when owners have like unrealistic expectations like they say hey on quarter zillow if you look at my house worth a million dollars but you know that this house only worth big six hundred thousand dollars how do you like have the conversation and convince them like i mean that's a big cut right a million six hundred thousand or i mean a big cut big cut right how do you yeah. convince them like hey 
I know you. I know you've seen on Zillow. The Ripto company, however, comma, this is the real deal. This is a market, so to speak. You know. Yeah. Uh, data. Mm -hmm. Straight out data. Yeah. Like yes, this is what Zillow says. This is what Redfin says. This is what sold homes say. Mm -hmm. Like this is. These are the actual numbers. Yeah. You know, here is a house just like yours that sold two days ago. Yeah, it's a, that month. house three doors down, exactly like yours, same square foot or whatever. It sold for this amount. Yep. Oh, by the way, they have all these upgrades. You ain't done shit to your house. Yes, yes. And, you know, and it's hard, too, because, um, like, listing a house, you know, as an agent, you'll go out and look at all the other houses that are for sale so you can have a really good idea yeah. of what the competition is. Um, and sometimes you'll need to bring the seller with you so that they can have a, a, a deeper understanding of, you know, what what is out there. And, you know, some sellers really think their house is... Of course they do. Pretty fabulous, and it's it. and how about the, the opposite, right? Like someone, like someone's house is worth, we say, six hundred thousand dollars, and this this one to move, right? They want to move to Alabama or to get get out of Dodge, or whatever. And so they say we're going to sell it for four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Like, how do you convince them that no, you need to raise it up somewhere, or do you just say no, that's your decision? You know, like sell for four hundred thousand. Are you like, of course, commission for six hundred thousand is way more than four hundred thousand dollars. Has some tough interest in the two, right? How do you balance that, mm -hmm. right? Well, you know, I think you balance it in again data like mm. this is what you're sacrificing to do that mm. and then number two the market's not going to let it sell for four hundred thousand yeah. dollars right if you put a six hundred thousand dollar house on a four hundred thousand dollars a whole bunch of people are going to make it worth more than four hundred thousand mm. dollars with their offer actually that might be a good thing to do right yeah well yeah it's a it's a it's one avenue that agents have done for yeah. you know, the past several years you know the low price to mm. to get the bidding wars. yeah and, and it works mo most of the time nice um so once again anything else you want to talk about before we get out of here not that I can think of. Okay. Um, so um, last question. Can you give us any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Ooh, boy. Um, you know, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, I feel like I should say something about housing. Um, buying a house or selling a house is all about life. What's going on in your life, right? It's not a right or wrong time. It depends on what's going on in your life. Um, right? Be true to yourself shed all the crap that you think you're supposed to do or should do and just try to dig in and what you want to do nice tammy thanks for your time today really appreciate it thank you so very much i enjoyed being here and for our listeners at kevin's at uh, the days of kevin experience at kevin's hr we're doing an equity crowd on the refunder campaign to learn more how to become an early investor in kevin's hr go to https refunder.com slash kevin's hr thanks for your time and remember to be great every day <laughs>